hockey fans, are you ready to brave the wild with me, your host, Paladino Joey, or Joey Wygen? Brave the Wild is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, PodMN, iHeartRadio, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, and Double Twist. Thank you always for joining this show. Thank you very much, TuneIn Radio. If I didn't mention that one, my apologies. PodMN is the local one that all of us like to... Uh, talk about because you know you can get rewarded joining on that one and it's exclusive to minnesota based podcasts minnesota sports minnesota politics which is kind of scary stuff when you think about that and uh well minnesota based science who who knows what the heck else you could get to on there so it's always fun to recommend that one even though every application works and i appreciate each and every one of you that do listen worldwide thank you all so very much that have supported this show over the course of time this one is the annual granddaddy of them all, State of the Wild 2020. But it's a little later than normal because I think you know why. I think we've talked about it too at uh, nauseum as to why everything's later. Yeah, like hockey in August, hockey in September, hockey in whenever. Um, yeah, usually it's preseason hockey in September, not like playoff and championship type hockey in you know September. But, well... It is what it is. I mean, <laughs> what are you going to do? Um, at least we got hockey again. A lot of fun to watch. Uh, at the time I'm recording this, we're still in the, uh, the obviously in the earlier stages, Chicago and Vegas. I'm just letting you know about that. Of course, piecing, pie, piecing things together as we go, this and that, because obviously the wild season is over, so we can do the Minnesota wild season wrap-up in segment number one. Segment number two, we'll look around the uh, free agent market, this and that. This and that, free agent market, the draft, we'll preview a bit of that. And, of course, we'll review the uh, Minnesota, or excuse me, we'll review the Stanley Cup playoffs a bit, how things went and all that. And, of course, segment number three will be specifically fan interaction and all that. So segment number two will be kind of a fun conversation, I suppose. But this one will be the season wrap-up, the annual kind of look at things, look how things went, what could have been, what never was, really, because things did not start well at all for Minnesota. Yeah, at all. Uh, Bruce Boudreau, he just knew he was going to be in trouble, even though Paul Fenton was gone. And it was nothing personal. It's business. It's not his fault, necessarily, the way the team was constructed. And obviously, when you bring in a new general manager two different times, you figure, how the heck is a coach going to survive that for an entire season? Well, he didn't. (laughs) Paul Fenton wanted to let Bruce Boudreau go back in, was it like, December 2018. And, well, he was let go on (laughs) February 14th. 2020, happy Valentine's Day. That was kind of fun. But no, let's look at the start of the season. Things did not start out well at all. Getting crushed in Nashville 5-2. Beat by Colorado pretty soundly on the road 4-2. And the Wild did get the, the, you know, the short straw, so to speak, starting with tons and tons and tons of road games to open up the season. And they got the, like a bye earlier in the year, like in the after two games. I don't know what the point of that was, to be quite honest. Uh, after the Colorado loss, the Wild don't play again for five more days. Another road game against Winnipeg, five to two loss, and then oh well, we host Pittsburgh. It's a home game. Let's let's go. I mean, we've had some success against Pittsburgh sometimes, and we get demolished seven to four. I mean, woofda. Doesn't even matter who's in net. And of course, Devin Dubnik did not start out the season well at all, at all. And it was a harbinger for things to come for our buddy Devin Dubnik, as just sometimes it's just you know, <laughs> sometimes. Goalies just run out of gas. Uh, Matt Murray started off the season terribly, and he got better as as things progressed, this and that. But uh, he did not start out well either. Wild did manage to score four goals, which is nice. It's twice as many goals as we'd scored in the previous three games. You know, it was 5-2, 4-2, 5-2. Great start to the season. And then again, seven goals given up. I mean, just look at the goals against average here. Uh, Devin Dubnik, what, his save percentage against Pittsburgh was like 70%. I mean, that's lucky to even be that high because seven goals is a lot. Uh, Minnesota finally wins a game <laughs> on October the 14th. We finally win a game. We started off 0-4. It felt like 0-15, but uh, we beat Ottawa 2 to nothing. That was nice. On the road, yes, another road game, as literally how many games were on the road here? I mean, before we finally got a tiny bit of a home stretch. I mean, we're talking, I mean, my my lord, I mean, we're talking like six, seven games on the road. We finally got our second home game against the Montreal Canadiens on the 20th. Little did we know, after getting whooped by Pittsburgh in the regular season home opener for Minnesota, um, the home opener on the 12th of October, and then, oh yeah, we beat this Montreal team. It just kind of sucks. Little did we know what Montreal would do to Pittsburgh in the playoffs. Um, let's see how many months later, about 11, 10, 10, 11 months later, 10 months later, yeah, 10 months later. 
<laughs> the, uh, 10 months, not five months, but 10 months later. Yeah, then we shut out Edmonton. It's like right when Edmonton's good again, the Wild are good against Edmonton. And when Edmonton sucks, Edmonton beats us. Wrap your head around that. That's just typical. Just typical. As again, we're just going to kind of comb over how things went during the course of the season to kind of get a vibe and give you a bit of a wrap-up. But that's the first shutout of the year. Edmonton Oilers, 22nd of October. Edmonton team, there was just no fire, no life in this game from the Edmonton Oilers. They were just bad. Uh, they were just bad. And Devin Dubnik and Alex Stala combined for a shutout. Strange situation there because, of course, uh, Dubnik hurt during the course of that game. Again, I mean, just, you know, he gets banged up and mentally fried, this and that, but the Wild have a combined shutout, which is the darndest thing you ever saw against an Edmonton team that just kind of showed up kind of bored in this game. I don't know why, but they just were. Uh, Wild win their... <laughs> Wild win their first home game of the season. No, second home game of the season. Back-to-back -back home wins against Canadian teams. Montreal and Edmonton. No, Montreal and Edmonton. And if, uh, this is after getting shut out by Carey Price on the 17th, earlier on the road against the Montreal Canadiens. Then you keep losing this and that. Just an awful month of October, generally speaking. But the Wild somehow come out with four wins after the month of October. I mean, we're talking four, six, <laughs> nine losses. So the Wild come out four and nine. Not a good start. Uh, in, in, in hockey, four and nine is kind of like a death sentence because catching up is not easy. Then you get beat by St. Louis. 4-3. to three. Well played game, but the Wilds still end up losing that one. You give up six goals to San Jose. You beat Anaheim 4-2. to two. You beat Arizona. Blah, blah, blah. You lose at LA, which is ridiculous. It's awful as the Kings have been 3-1. to one. Only managed one goal in that game, but we managed to beat Arizona twice. Home and away. Pretty impressive. This and that during the course of November there. No surprise losing to Carolina. We beat Buffalo this time on the road, which is nice. You beat Colorado, which is extremely fun. 21st of November. Lots of fun. No surprise, a loss to Boston, but a well-fought 5-4 to four loss. You crushed Ottawa 7-2 to two to wrap things up after uh, losing to New York and beating New Jersey on back-to-backs in the New York area there. Cool stuff. Well, we're kind of slowly inching back into place. And then in December, the Wilds start things off with a three-game win streak versus Dallas, Florida, and Tampa. Who saw that coming? Wow. Teams that used to own Minnesota. Except for Tampa. For some reason, the Wild have always played well against Tampa. Dallas has just owned the Wild forever. Florida is just one of those trap games. When they're good, they're good. When they're bad, they're bad. But it's a trap game to, for us in one way or another. But winning in Florida is not something the Wild do very often. In fact, almost never. Two places, California and Florida, have just been doomed for the Wild for pretty much all of eternity. Um, you lose at Carolina 6-2, to two, just demolition. Kind of shades of the 2006 season when Carolina won the Stanley Cup. I remember, I still remember the Wild losing to them 7-2, to two, just getting obliterated. And it's like, this Carolina team's awesome. And they won the championship that year with a very young Mr. Eric Stahl leading the way. But it's like, as things kind of gradually move forward, Kevin Fiala was getting scratched, Kevin Fiala was this, Kevin Fiala was that, and he would start to score a couple points. Things would start to get a little bit better. You lose games like the Toronto 4-2, to two, this and that. Just frustration, situ uh, frustrating situation. Devin Nubnik would give up three goals basically every game, if that, if not more. And that, that's just kind of how things would go. During the course of time, a 6 nothing loss to Winnipeg on the 21st. That was pretty much demolition derby there. A 6-4 to four win over Colorado. For some reason, the Wild had good success against Colorado this year. And I believe if the Wild could have advanced and somehow maybe the Wild would have bumped into Colorado in the postseason, I got a sneaky feeling the Wild beat them. Uh, it's the old, when Colorado was favored, the Wild would win. When the Wild were favored, Colorado would win in the postseason. That's just how it is. It was just, I don't know why, but that's how it is. Always the opposite team would win. The underdog team would win. Uh, no surprise, the Wild lose to Chicago. A very, very rare loss to Las Vegas on the 17th. 8-5 to five demolition versus Arizona. Victory. Victory. The Wild actually starts scoring some goals. And this is about that period when the Wild became one of the highest scoring teams in the National Hockey League. Uh, pretty damn exciting, to be quite honest. As I'm seeing some stuff that's kind of surprising me. Is it possible? No. It <laughs> can't be, right? Did Matt Zuccarello already have nine goals at this stage? That can't be right. But uh, yeah, he had a three-point game. Very impressive. Three-point game. Eric Stahl, three-point game. Just want to look at this one because it's exciting. Uh, Victor Rask, this is when he was getting some action, and he was clutch. He's not a guy I look at during the course of the season 
and say he was awful because nobody expected a damn thing out of the guy. And when he got in there, he was okay. Obviously, he can't skate. He's not really an NHL player for some reason, even though he did have a 48-point season not even that long ago for the Carolina Panthers. And it's a position of need, the center position. But generally speaking, he's not a guy you want to see uh, play uh, too much. Nick Steeler would constantly be scratched, whether he was healthy or not. He would just get scratched all the time, and he was just completely buried pretty much ever since late last season with the whole Botetto situation. Steeler came back, just was never the same ever since then. Ended up getting traded to Chicago for not a whole lot and didn't see a whole lot of action with them either. Just some major frustrations. But again, Dubnik, generally speaking, always giving up a ton of goals, so I guess we might as well score a ton of goals to give us some hope. But then he got his <laughs> he got another shutout against the Calgary Flames, which is very uh, very surprising because the Wild almost always lose to that team for whatever reason. But, uh, of course, the Wild would not end the month of November, or December, pardon me, very strongly. But we would score a ton of goals during the course of time, as the Wild were hot, basically, from November until well into January, scoring tons and tons of goals most of the time, except a 2-1 to loss to Calgary, but a 5-4 to loss to Calgary as well in a home-and-home situation during the course of a week with three days off in between, getting swept by Calgary in that little two-game deal, you could call it. Uh, Pittsburgh scored seven goals twice against Minnesota during the course of the season, so 14 goals given up versus the Pittsburgh Penguins in just two games because, of course, your conference deal when you're uh, uh, in the opposite conference, you only play them twice, one home, one away. That's old news. And then the biggest shocker of the whole season, I would say, well, one of the biggest is, you know, Staluck obviously getting the shutout, which is nice against the Dallas Stars, but the Wild beating the Dallas Stars 7 to nothing That came very surprising, January the 18th, as we... Uh, ring in the new year, as people like to say, and just an absolutely exciting day for Minnesota Wild fans, to say the least. I mean, absolutely shocking. Seven goals. Seven goals. Matt Zuccarello actually had 12 goals already at this stage, so he actually started the season decently, but as the season progressed, Zuccarello would continue to disappear more and more, and there's no way he's worth $6 million a year. I mean, it's not personal, it's business. <laughs> it really isn't. Parisi already had his 18th goal, so it's because guys were hot. That's why you're seeing nice numbers for some of these players that you're not expecting to see, like 18 goals already for Parisi. But they were on fire at that time. I mean, when you see guys like Zuccarello with, you know, a, a number of points in a game and Parisi with 18 goals, you know, at the midway point of the season, you think, wow, he was having a good year. So what happened in the playoffs? Well, you know, <laughs> it's just, well, when you're off for a long time, that doesn't help. But it also, at the same time, you don't feel a whole lot of confidence uh, in these guys in the postseason historically anyway. It's just some of them, sometimes they show up, sometimes they don't. And Parisi looked, again, like I'm, like I said on the last episode, looked he looked like a few years older, actually. And that looked, that, it, it, it's, it's weird. He looked like an old guy out there. He just did. He looked old to me. Uh, back and forth month of February. The Wild generally playing well. You have a three-game win streak despite a 6-1 to loss demolition on February the 1st. 6-1 to demolition in XL Energy Center. 6-1, to which drew a lot of boos from the crowd. Then you get a three-game win streak against three hated teams, Chicago Blackhawks, Vancouver Canucks, and Dallas Stars. All one-point games, except for Vancouver, I guess. You end up beating Vegas. But then you lose a few games in a row. Or no, you lose uh, You lose to the New York Rangers 4-3 to in a game you think, you know, you beat Vegas 4 to nothing. Nice, solid, competitive, nice, solid thrashing of a very good Vegas team who was going through a coaching change around this time but they were starting to play a little bit better around this time as well. They were starting to pick it up a bit was the, where the Vegas Golden Knights, particularly into February and into March and that's why they picked up where they left off in a lot of ways. Uh, Fiala and this is when Fiala really started to take charge uh, in early February but also even a couple of games before that a uh, little ways before this uh, multiple points in this one, three-point game, and was awesome against the Vegas Golden Knights. His 14th goal of the season already, actually at this stage, so he'd have it, obviously definitely picked it up in a big way by this stage, and fans were starting to get really excited that finally we have something here. And he was working very well with head coach Bruce Boudreaux, but that game against the New York Rangers was just disappointing enough for not only uh, Bill Guerin, but just uh, just generally speaking... He didn't see that this team was playing properly for Bruce Boudreaux. Maybe that they weren't taking the chances they needed to in certain situations. You know, guys weren't stepping up. Maybe Bruce, Bruce Boudreaux was a little bit too paranoid about it. But again, when you have the goaltending the way things were going this year, how can you blame him? 
uh, not having defensemen step up, but sometimes maybe you have to take a risk because there just wasn't as much fire, not as much forecheck, uh, not as much puck, puck movement as you'd like. I mean, whatever the reason, it was the reason. And on the 14th, after that disappointing loss to the New York Rangers in Exile Energy Center, Bill Guerin surprised everybody and fired Bruce Bruder despite, uh, despite having a pretty good run the last few weeks and on, on Valentine's Day. So that was the end of that. You bring in Dean Evison and you have a gutless, heartless, lifeless loss to the San Jose Sharks. And you had a weird moment where it looked like Dean Evison was just kind of letting the players talk this over, talk that over. He wasn't even really in the mix. He probably felt like he was lame duck at the moment or maybe he was just letting things kind of come together and he'd figure how to handle things after this. But that was a very scary start to Dean Evison's career. You thought there was, he had no chance of returning as head coach of the Wild. Little did we know things would change immediately right after this. A 4-3 win in Vancouver, 5-3 win in Edmonton, and Kevin Fiala would just continue to rise to the occasion. And it was so exciting. 4-1 to loss to, uh, against the St. Louis Blues was not super surprising, but a 5-4 win versus Columbus to the Wild never beat. 7-1 to demolition of an awful Detroit team. 5 nothing crushing to the uh, Columbus Blue Jackets. Shocking. You, we went we went into Columbus, Ohio, which the Wild basically never have much success in, ever. Uh, Alex Dalek gets a, 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 another shout-out. He's becoming pretty much the number one goalie around this time. In fact, he was already kind of heading in that direction, but this is when he was cementing himself as that guy, at least for this particular season. We'll see what happens after that. But a 5 nothing crushing of the Columbus Blue Jackets late in February was quite a shocker. Everybody was just blown away. Kevin Fiala would already have his 19th goal of the season. Absolutely exciting. <laughs> Jewel Erickson would get his 8th goal, which is like a career high, which is kind of funny. Uh, man, another multi-point game for Kevin Fiala. There'd be just like, felt like a, a million of those during the course of the last few weeks at this point. Uh, people very, very pumped up about this. Guys are seeing more and more excitement, more and more hope for the future. Because you have Kirill Kaprizov coming in, but now you have this guy as well. You know, you have a franchise type of a winger joining Kirill Kaprizov, which is everybody just tickled pink, per se. See, for the longest stretch, Fiala was in the mix with like one point here, one point there. You know, it's not like he was invisible earlier in the season, like November and such. He was already showing signs. He would get an assist in several games in a row, at least one point, like six games in a row, this and that, and then it would be like every other game, and then he'd have another little streak in every other little game. And then he had a complete death, a complete dead streak from... Uh, it would just completely shut down. Where was I? I'm like losing pace where I am here. But it would it quieted down bits and, at bits and times in January, and then all of a sudden he just took off from pretty much February 4th on. And you saw a guy for the next month, month and a half look like a franchise winger for this club. Look like a Marion Gabrick. Like a legitimate Marion Gabrick type of player. Just a different face. Different generation, you can say. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing. Beautiful thing to watch. And he picked up where he left off when it got to the postseason. So at least we have that going for us as we continue to move forward. But uh, it was a nice end of the month of... February, a lot of people were afraid that uh, things might get shut down for a while at this point, as the coronavirus had already kind of become the top story everywhere you look at this stage. <sighs> Which was, you know, a sad, frustrating thing for all of us. No doubt about it. Is there just be a few games left before things would get shut down, unfortunately. But the Wild were kind of inching closer and closer to that pl uh, that playoff spot, even though they never really overtake it. They maybe would for a second and then lose it again. You lose uh, four to three to Washington. You beat Nashville three to one, San Jose three to two, and get crushed by LA again, which I don't understand. Just don't understand. Seven to three loss to the LA Kings. You beat Anaheim, and then from there on, the Vegas game. We were all ready to go. March twelfth, all ready to go. Excited to play Vegas. Figure we'll beat them, and then we got a tough one versus Philly. We almost never beat Philadelphia. Then you get Chicago twice coming up the next week. Ooh, see how that goes in Winnipeg. Some major rivals. Nashville's a major rival as well. And then everyone's called off the ice, and it's it's over. Not only is there no practice, not only is there this, not only is there that, 
it's not going to be a little quarantine thing and we'll be right back ready to go. That's it. And that would be it until my birthday, July 29th, where the Wild would play on, play against the Colorado Avalanche. <laughs> and not win that game, unfortunately. And, well, we would just kind of, you know, then you'd enter the postseason and end up losing three games to one to the Vancouver Canucks. Of course, I already reviewed that at length on the very recent episode, so I'm not going to jump into that again at this stage. But definitely a sad, sad finish to what was, you know, some hope for some of us. You, th- you thought something might happen, but it just didn't. Uh, Colorado game, you would see Matt Dumba finally score again, which was always very nice. I never thought I'd see an actual hockey game on my birthday unless it was some kind of off-the-wall deal. I suppose it was off-the-wall. But no, you got your hopes up with a 3 nothing win versus Vancouver in Game 1, and then you lose three in a row, and that was all she wrote. And Vancouver's looked oh so promising ever since. <laughs> so we'll see. We'll see. They have uh, they've been absolutely fantastic so far early in the first round versus St. Louis. So we'll see what happens as we move forward into the next segments. This and that, because <laughs> we'll talk about the actual postseason in the next segment when things are a lot more final. This and that. Um, but generally speaking, I mean, it was a fun season, and there's something to look forward to. But there's still gaping holes. You know, I mean, that's the thing. It's not 100% doom and gloom, but you're kind of stuck in the middle, and you're legitimately stuck in the middle as well. Uh, you're stuck in the middle in terms of your win-loss record. You get the ninth pick in the draft, which isn't that bad. That's the good part. That's uh, you know that's the upper third of the draft, so that's good. At least it's a potentially good uh, good pick. It's just disgusting and frustrating considering that the New York Rangers are going to get the number one pick after getting Capo Caco just a year ago number two overall, so that kind of sucks. And years ago, whenever there was a huge name free agent, where did they always go? The New York Rangers. And it just got old and frustrating. And when they finally stopped doing that kind of sort of, you don't see everybody going to the Rangers except, well, I guess Panarin, yay. And now they get the number one pick in the draft, and it's Lavernet, you know, and that really sucks. So, I don't know, it's always going to be some big, huge East Coast type of team, I suppose, or maybe Toronto. But ended up being the New York Rangers and the ball bouncing awkwardly and it just reeks of being rigged. It always does, but I don't know. What can you do? I mean, maybe once in a blue moon we'll get lucky. It's just not again. Again this time, we're wild or not lucky, so we will be picking fourth in the draft and we'll talk about that in the upcoming segment, the, uh, the latter stages of that, not the first part. Or depending on how I feel. It's going to be a strange, kind of a strange setup because now we actually have a legitimate fan interaction segment, which we didn't before. So we'll see how things set things up as we move forward. In the past years when I did this episode, we didn't have a a full-on fan interaction segment like we do now. Oh, boy. People upstairs are very distracting when somebody's trying to do a show. But what can I do about it, right? (laughs) Yeah. Uh, But generally speaking, the goaltending was not up to par. Uh, Bill Guerin, just listening to him talk was a lot of fun. You know, it's kind of his post-game conversation. And then there is a uh, straight-from-the-source Michael Russo episode just recently, which I guess was cut short because of technical problems, but it still was a good 50 minutes. Michael Russo and Bill Guerin. Now wrap your head around that. Just imagine. Can you imagine for one second in what universe would (laughs) Paul Fenton ever do that with Michael Russo, much less really anybody else. But obviously Michael Russo and him were kind of on a different... They're, they're kind of like oil and water because Michael Russo's an aggressive guy who tries to get information and he's, he's awesome at what he does in so many ways. Not just at writing, but at getting information and going about it the way he does, being aggressive. And Paul Fenton's the kind of guy who's like, no, just slams the door on your face. Where most general managers, they might get frustrated with it sometimes, but they're humane and they understand you have a job to do and... Quite frankly, you're in. It, it's an entertainment industry. This isn't just. This isn't war. This isn't World War Two. This isn't talking. This isn't giving information about the Nazis. <laughs> I'm mean, giving information to the Nazis about our submarines in in the Atlantic Ocean here. I mean, it's not quite that dangerous. It's not quite that life that life and death as Paul Fenton kind of made it. You know, so there might be. It might be okay to leak something once in a while, or not threaten somebody's job over it. And we didn't get that sense this time around. And (laughs) if there is any general manager on the planet who is entertaining to listen to, it's Bill Guerin. And it's not because he's, he just jokes around and acts silly. It's because he's just, you know, 
He's interesting to listen to. He's informative. He's blunt. And at the same time, he's not overly blunt. He's not like, oh, he absolutely sucks. We need to get rid of him. He'll just say, maybe this situation sucks. Hopefully we can uh, fix it. That's what he says. He'll he'll be open and honest without trashing anybody necessarily. And it's kind of cool. It's kind of cool. It's kind of refreshing. It really is. Uh, Chuck Fletcher was, you know, he was he was good about it, but this guy is a bit beyond. And the stories he can tell from his playing days are a lot of fun to listen to as well. Just uh, check it out. Obviously, Michael Russo doesn't necessarily need my help, but uh, if I recommend any single episode that Michael Russo's done on Straight From The Source, holy, holy Toledo, that one's a keeper. You might want to listen to that one 10 years from now. Again, for like the 17th time or 19th time or 45th time, depending on what it is. It was it was great. Uh, obviously, you got honest uh, honest conversation about the goaltending situation in the uh, postseason presser with him and uh, Dean Evason, where he's basically uh, you know they asked him you know when uh, Bill Guerin talked about the parting ways of the Minnesota Wild and Bob Mason, who's been the goalie coach for 17 years, pretty amazing when you think about it. Going back to the Dwayne Rollison era. Manny Fernandez, you know, the first goalies basically other than Jamie McLennan the first year. Uh, pretty crazy stuff. Um, they let him go, and they asked, was it because uh, you're disappointed in how things went with the goaltenders this year? And he said, uh, yeah, 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 like he was honest. And he was saying how him and Bob Mason are, are friends. He, they, they consider each other friends, this and that, but it was time time to move on, time for a change. And there'll probably be a change of the goaltender position somehow, some way. Devin Dubnik, it's not the worst buyout ever. Maybe just because obviously, what is it, like 4.3 for one year remaining? It's also a very tradable asset, I got to think, because it's just one year. It's an expiring contract. That's a tradable asset, depending on how much money you have to bring back in return, how much term you're bringing back in return. Or if you do buy them out, what is it? What would it be about? Because you're considering splitting it in half or so. So approximately 2.6 million uh, cap hit for two years basically, because that's usually how it works. That's where Zuccarello, if he did something crazy like that, it'd be $3 million cap hit for eight years. Eight. So that's a lot of dead cap hanging around. So uh, Zuccarello getting bought out is like one in a billion. Even uh, Victor Rask, it's sizable, because, you know, it's $2 million. Obviously, he's making four a year, and it's two years remaining. So if you do the buyout, that would be four years of $2 million per so $2 million cap hit, per se, for four more freaking years. So that's something to consider when you talk about buyouts. That one's possible because $2 million isn't going to necessarily kill you, but it could it could hurt a little bit if you're not careful. Um, Galchenyuk, with the way he performed during the uh, regular season, I don't know what to say. Obviously, you saw Jason Zucker get traded earlier on as well in a fascinating trade. Uh, you get Galchenyuk in return which is, you know, you can consider him like the the Devin Setaguchi of the trade, the actual live player who's not that exciting. You get the draft pick. You know, this is, of course, the Brent Burns trade. I don't think Jason Zucker is going to go on to be a Hall of Fame type of player. And you got the 28th pick in the draft. Uh, this year you might get something like the 14th or something. But uh, odds are the Penguins will keep it because they're probably expecting to be better next year. So they have a choice to uh, keep it. Or give it to us right away, or keep it for next year and hope that they'll be significantly better next year. Or in our case, we hope they'll be significantly worse, and we get super lucky and get the number one pick in the draft or something like what happened with Ottawa a couple of years ago, where Ottawa gave up their draft pick and <laughs> ended up being a number one pick in the draft. Painful, painful stuff. <sighs> At the end of the day, um, where do things go now? I'm not sure. Again, we're welcoming the Seattle crack into the league. That's always good, but we're not quite at the uh, expansion draft until next summer, so we'll worry about that next time around when we do our State of the Wild show. That type of situation, what happens with Parisi in the offseason, we'll talk about that more in the next segment, but just kind of generally looking at things for the moment of how things stand. Of course, I always like to look at their cap friendly, this and that, and I'll look deeper into that on the in the next segment. For now, <clears throat> looking over the season, this and that, the guy who led the Wild in scoring, was Kevin Fiala with 54 points in 64 games. Again, scratched earlier in the year, 23 total goals, 31 points. Finished second 
on the team to Zach Parisi with 25 goals. Parisi obviously quieted down a bit after having 18 goals fairly early there. Zuccarillo finished with respectable numbers when you consider how disappointing he was. And again, the minus 9 doesn't look good. 37 points in 65 games isn't the worst thing you ever saw, but his playoff performance sucked. And of course, the fact that it's a no move and you're expecting him to continue to slow down in the next f- four or five years, that's where it gets extremely frustrating. Jerry Spurgeon, very solid. Doesn't put up the sexiest numbers you ever saw necessarily, but he's super clutch and obviously makes such great plays defensively. Right time, right place. And when you need something from him offensively, he provides it. Still did get 12 goals, which is really damn good for a defenseman, to be quite honest. That's awesome. Only two goals less than Sucker in the 45 games he played with Minnesota before being traded. So all those quote-unquote young guys from the previous group, the previous quote-unquote half-generation of young players are all gone now. You know, the uh, Charlie Coyle, Mikhail Granlin. You don't need a writer. Jason Zucker. They're all gone now. You got this next group of Donato, Greenway, Eric Sinek, Kunin. Uh, Kunin. We'll see what happens with those guys, of course. <clears throat> Not sure 100% what's going to happen there. Somebody's probably going to get traded, and again, we'll talk about that later on. We'll wait on what happens. You, you do have depth at the right shot position in the minor leagues and in the system. You got uh, Addison, who's extremely exciting, but of course, still relatively unknown, as good as he is. It's just relatively unknown how he's going to perform at the next level. But all indicators are he's going to translate very well. Uh, He looks very special out there. His skating is outstanding, is outstanding, and his puck movement is incredible. And he's got, he's ever capable of of doing a hell of a job, like a 60 point guy in the juniors thus far, so in the WHL. So we'll see what happens. See what happens there. Uh, Eric Stahl, respectable season, 47 points. Just looks slower and slower every time he's out there. Every year he's out there, he just looks a little bit slower, but continues to produce. That's the interesting part. He continues to find a way to produce still with 47 points, and it does help when you're on the same line with Kevin Fiala. Um, <clears throat> Ryan Suter, 48 points in only 69 games. of Quietly, extremely strong season for Ryan Suter. Absolutely very strong season for him. Uh, Luke Cunning career highs of 15 goals, 8 is, uh, give me 16 assists, 31 total points in the 63 games he played. You know, he doesn't necessarily bring you out of your seat, but it's still solid stuff, and if he can move to that next level, 20 goals, 25 assists, 45 points, that's not too bad. 25 and 25 would be absolutely great, or 25 and 30, 55 points. That would be a nice ceiling for Luke Cunning if he can head in that direction, and I hope he can. I think, I think it's there. He certainly has an aggressive side to him, and you know he's not a he, he's not scared of anybody. That's what's good. The guy that's driving everybody crazy, and I talked about it on the last episode. And somebody I'd be willing to part ways with is Jordan Greenway. Heading into the off season, I'm not that excited about him. He's just another guy who has size, he has skill, but he doesn't seem to assert himself at all. He doesn't assert himself physically, and he doesn't assert himself in the offensive game a whole lot. He'll show flashes here and there, Charlie Coyle. He'll show flashes here and there, but it's just not happening. And that's where you get the mass frustration at the end of the day. Only eight goals in the 67 games he played, 28 total points. It's like, oh, he's young. He's young. It'll keep coming. It'll come. He'll get better. Well, so far, I don't really see it. I don't. And in college, he didn't really stand out that much. He had a hat trick once. Once. And other than that, uh, he, he didn't stand out that much. There was always this hope, though, like he's young. He, he'll get more aggressive. He'll get more assertive. And it never really happened. Ryan Donato, his point production in a limited time on ice is fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. But what happens when he does get more time on ice? What happens? So that's the question. He did get 14 goals in extremely limited action out there. Uh, did play in 62 games, but again, played on the bottom six pretty much the entire time, most of the time. Still found a way to get 14 goals, though, on the season, and Gives you some hope, but certainly not 100% of hope at the end of the day. Uh, Galchenyuk is a guy I don't care if he comes back. Pattern, oof, duh. I mean, I don't want to see him on the wild anymore. He absolutely should be a buyout candidate, but you can't buy everybody out. You have so much dead cap, you don't know what to do with it. Even though when he's on the roster, he's dead cap as well, but it's only one year remaining versus two. So think about it that way, I guess. Uh, Victor Rask might be just kind of in the way, and you don't really want to pay a guy $4 million dollars to uh, <laughs> play in the AHL. That's the other thing where pattern, you might be able to get away with it a little bit. <sighs> Putting him in the AHL, uh, 
I don't know. Yeah, even he, I mean, I can't even, you know, Paul Fenton, he sucked at free agency. He, you know, he, him and his scouting team did a damn good job in the draft. His trades were bizarre for the most part, except for Kevin Fiala. Free, agents, free agency is just awful. 2.25 for Greg Bleepin Pattern. I mean, I don't know. He never did anything, really. Uh, a little kid in Dallas liked him a lot. That's about it. <laughs> I mean, that's about it. And Matt Zuccarello's the Albatross contract that has everybody, you know, just staring at Cap Friendly saying, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, four more freaking years at six million per. It's not like he's terrible, but he's not worth, you know, he's not worth that. And he's just going to get worse every year. So that's where the frustration continues to mount. And all the hope, obviously, is in the young guys in the system. And some of the young guys on the current roster. Others, they just don't stand out a whole lot. Jewel Erickson is a fantastic defensive defenseman, but that's all there is to say there. Jonas Burdine, if you have to keep only one of the two between Jonas Burdine and Matt Dumba, gauging on how things went during the course of the season and into the the postseason, it's got to be 100% Jonas Burdine, not Matt Dumba. And, well, you know, we'll, we'll see how much money we'll have to give to Jonas Burdine because he becomes a free agent after next season. He's an expiring contract, 4.166 Six six seven, you know. So yeah, you get the idea. A little less than four point two million a year at the moment. Uh, there are some projections that they have a contract that might be looking at seven to eight million per year for Jonas Burdine going forward. I hope it's not that much. I hope it's not that much. And well, if you just stick with the six million of Dumba and take a chance that he's, you know, uh, Brent Burns light, I guess so be it. This and that. So. Again, I'm kind of semi-getting ahead of myself, even though at the same time it is kind of a season wrap-up in terms of what guy I'd like to keep with how things went during the course of the season. To me, it's Jonas Brodeen, but I guess it all depends on the price and the situation heading with the Seattle draft. And, man, I, I don't know. And what the Wild need, obviously, down the middle, which is the center position. I mean, we were so desperate. We had Galchenyuk playing third-line center. And he probably shouldn't be on the Wild at all. He's not a good center. Uh, Stahl's too old to be a full-time center, uh, top center. Koivu's ancient history. Don't expect him back. Jewel Erickson is productive, kind of. He's great defensively, but other than that, I don't know. Cunning, I don't know. So, obviously, lots of work to be done as we continue to move forward with that. Um, let's look at the uh, overall awards for the season and wrap up this segment, I suppose, as we head forward. The most valuable player for the Minnesota Wild when it comes to 2019-2020, it's Kevin Fiala, and there's no question about it. Uh, before he emerged, there really kind of wasn't one, was there? I mean, it could have been Parisi, it could have been Suter, it could have been Stahl. It probably would have been Suter when you consider he would have led the team in the scoring if not for Kevin Fiala. So it would have been Ryan Suter with a bullet considering the position he plays, and he's a defensive-minded center, yet he still wound up with 48 bleeping points in only 69 games with uh, the lockout, and plus his reliability. And whenever he's out of the lineup, it's a strange situation, my boy. Strange situation. Um, Ryan Suter is, uh, would be the MVP of this team if not for Kevin Fiala's emergence, but he is the most valuable player, and that is Kevin Fiala. No question about it. With Ryan Suter a strong second place, though, at the end of the day. The biggest disappointment of the season? You want to say, you know, it could be Matt Zuccarello considering the contract, considering the productivity, for me, it's Matt Dumba. Um, the health situation, uh, obviously, you want to believe he could get his timing back, this and that, but it just never was there. Uh, a lot of the gaffes, a lot of the, the poor decisions out there seem to be kind of back full force. Generally speaking, it was just not a good year for Matt Dumba. Uh, and a lot of fans were super frustrated with the constant shot block, shot block, shot block situation that kept happening for Matt Dumba during the course of the season. So that's another reason. I would say uh, Matt Dumba's the biggest disappointment of the year, but Matt Zuccarello pretty much right there with him. And the biggest surprise of the season is Kevin Fiala because, you know, a lot of us were kind of seeing him as a guy who had skill, but would he ever assert himself? Was he anything close to this game-breaker that Paul Fenton kept advertising? Was he anywhere near that? And then, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> by, by by With certain flashes in December into January, it's like, yeah, it looks like he might be. And by February, it's like, oh, yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. <laughs> kind of basically like the way <laughs> Bill Garrett, every other time you ask him a question, he goes, yeah. You know, it's like, yeah, he is a game-breaker. And he's, he was the biggest surprise and the most valuable player of the season. Anybody else that could have been a big surprise this season, 
There really isn't, is there? I mean, Donato, 14 goals. It's not, like, surprising necessarily. Uh, Victor Rask getting a couple of clutch goals during the season was surprising, but he's really not the biggest surprise, and I wouldn't call him the biggest disappointment either because everybody was trashing him the whole year. Anyway, so how could you make him the biggest surprise uh, or biggest disappointment? Marcus Foligno was showing more and more leadership during the course of the season. A lot of people could see him as a future captain of this team, or at very least he should be an alternate, no doubt. Uh, Greenway was close to being a big disappointment, I would say, but I think Dumbo was even bigger because Dumbo's looked on as a star player. Some people were actually putting Dumbo as the biggest star on the wild uh, before Kevin Fiala emerged. That, that Dumbo was the star of the team, like legitimately the star of the team. Um, and I don't think he's anywhere near that right now. No, you know, at least at the moment. And Spurgeon's just kind of a solid glue guy of glue guys. He's the king of glue guys. And that's why he's pretty much my favorite player on the team, other than Kevin Fiala now. <laughs> so Fiala, biggest surprise MVP. And Dumba, biggest disappointment for 20, 19, 20, 20. With that, we'll take a quick break, and then we get to really dive into the draft, free agency, and look at this postseason and talk about your Stanley Cup champion right after this. <laughs> We are back here on Brave the Wild, segment number two. We're going to look at the draft a little bit and free agency, stuff like that. Going to tell you straight out, I'm not necessarily a draft expert, this type of thing, but I have done a little bit of my own research, and I'm going to refer a bit to Derek Felska, who does call himself a draft junkie, and I think he's done an awesome job. Creeds and assists, of course, you'll hear the name Derek Felska many, many, many times on this show. Uh, he'll also help field questions on Twitter for this particular one, because it's a lot to talk about. Uh, awesome article after article. Again, crease and assist on the sportsdaily.com. Of course, the NHL section, crease and assist is Derek Felska's particular blog slash article. And he talks about, you know, in, th- in three separate articles, the forwards, the defensemen, the goaltenders and such. Again, I did some of my own research also, but I'm going to cite him <laughs> for some of the information as well, probably a big chunk of it for particular players here and there, and just for additional information. Uh, What's going to happen with the Minnesota Wild, obviously going into the draft, ninth pick and everything, you're not going to get, you know, necessarily, you're not going to get Quinton Byfield, you're not going to get Lafayette. Uh, Certain other guys' stock goes up, other guys goes down. You you got Marco Rossi, you got Jamie Drysdale. Some people thought if uh, Jamie Drysdale's there, because maybe like Anton Lindell, Cole Perfetti, and Marco Rossi are all gone. Maybe go with Drysdale. Right now on MyNHLDraft.com, they have Drysdale going fifth overall to the Ottawa Senators. You never know truly what's going to happen. We've had several drafts where the Minnesota Wild would be taking Yaroslav Askarov, who is, wow, that guy is a legitimate goalie without a doubt. Um, He's definitely the best goalie in this draft, and I'm sure there's going to be other good goalies along the way. Of course, you don't want to get too over-the-top excited about one goalie because we all know what can happen sometimes. I mean, Rick DiPietro, pardon me, went number one overall to the New York Islanders years ago, and he was never that great. He had some moments, but did he ever really stand out as this franchise goalie of the future and like a superstar goalie? No, he he didn't. It's just, just being honest about all of that right there. But this guy does look legit from what I was seeing. It was uh, ridiculous the way he could change directions. He's on the he's off balance. He's on the wrong side because of obviously he'd been deked a certain way. He still found a way to move over to stop the puck with his glove. Unbelievable capabilities. You understand what I mean. He was moved over to the left and he was able to come back to the right with his glove side and make a spectacular save. There were just moments like that that impressed the hell out of me from what I could see out of uh, Askarov. It was constantly Askarov coming to Minnesota with the ninth pick. Now they have him dropping the 13th to the Carolina Hurricanes. They also have uh, the Edmonton Oilers taking him 14th, and I'm sure they would. I'm sure the Edmonton Oilers would take <laughs> Askarov 14th if they could. Uh, even if it takes a little while, hey, you have a goalie of the future. Maybe he'll be there sooner than other goaltenders. And then there you go. I mean, Edmonton can use a little goaltending right now. Uh, it's not like Mike Smith was bad. It's not like Cam Talbot was bad the year before, but they weren't that good. You know, they're, they're just kind of band-aids. They're just temporary, that type of thing. And there's no permanent goalie there uh, in Edmonton. So 
that's where that thought process would come. Like, finally, screw it. Let's just get a goalie we can call the goalie of the future, and let's go, rather than guys that might be goalies of the future. In Minnesota, I think we have some good options, and <laughs> letting the cat out of the bag here, I'm writing an article. Well, it might actually already be out by the time this show gets released. In fact, it is, most likely. Uh, Philip Lindbergh, I've been writing about Philip Lindbergh uh, at the time I'm recording this for my new uh, position with uh, Gone, uh, <laughs> Gone Puck Wild. Very excited to be on that page, finally being a writer after all these years, so I'm kind of uh, following Derek Felska a bit here. He actually used to work with them in the past. I had an interesting article about Miko Koivu, if you want to dig that up, from about five years ago. Not a huge fan of Miko Koivu, who, of course, will not be returning to the Minnesota Wild. Um, I'm not as sad about it either. Some people are. It's a loss. Of course it's a loss, but it's time to move on at the same time. Uh, the problem is, again, you got this big gaping hole in the middle now. Uh, Eric Stahl's a hell of a player, or at least he was. He's getting old, he's slow, this and that. And you got to address it. Uh, you're not going to get any immediate fix in the draft, but you will get long, uh, a long-term fix and hopefully multiple long-term fixes. You have guys in the in the grapevine who could be a number two but or a number three. We'll see what happens with Hovanov. I'm surprised a lot of people still call him Kovanov, but it is Hovanov. I mean, of course, I called him Kovanov forever as well, who will now be in the KHL. Uh, according to Michael Russo, a lot of people speaking of the KHL, not too happy about the Brennan Mennel uh, decision to go to the KHL for a year. He wants to come back, but we'll see what happens. They're not real happy about that in the organization from what he's been saying, my, Michael Russo. Unless, I'm, unless I heard him incorrectly, I listened back to it about three times <laughs> to make sure I was hearing it correctly on his... Uh, on, on his podcast now, it's the the talk talk North Hockey Show is what they call it now. It was Russo Suhan forever, and I loved that. Now it's no Suhan for some reason, but it is what it is. They're going to come up with some new name for it at some point, but uh, they're not too happy about that. So now you might have a gaping hole of uh, defense moving forward. So you go from a strength to a weakness, possibly. I was actually going to write an article, Russo style, right? I was going to write an article about Dumba versus Brodeen, who, who would be the better decision to trade this and that. And now it's like, well, maybe we don't want to talk about that too quickly. <laughs> it's like Brendan mendel has gone, this and that. And who knows, you know, you got uh, Brodeen's got free agency coming up soon. So it's going to be dramatic, this and that. It's all about the future of the Wild along with the present. When we talk about the draft and free agency, which is what this segment centers around. Centers around. How's that for a... <laughs> How's that for a transition, huh? Yeah. Quentin Byfield, Tim Stultz, Stultz, that'd be nice to have either one of those guys, but it isn't going to happen. Who knows, though? I mean, we may have a choice. We may have one of these guys fall to us, Jamie Drysdale. In fact, somebody's going to have to, Marco Rossi. Alexander Holtz is an interesting option at the right-wing position. It's still a position of need with Minnesota. Cole Bervetti is a left-shot center who can also play left-wing. Very interesting, very exciting player with the Saginaw spirit. He actually teamed up with... Our buddy uh, Damien Giroux. And that's actually some pretty good chemistry between those two guys. So it would be kind of cool if the Wild wound up with Cole Perfetti. Maybe Damien Giroux makes the Wild someday. We'll see what happens. Uh, they played very well together. It was kind of cool. Uh, Damien Giroux getting a lot of goals off the <laughs> from uh, off the guidance of uh, Cole Perfetti. They're a nice playmaker. He's got a nice release on his shot. A lot of his goals are were scored on one-timers and wristers, but not everything. Uh, in a lot of ways, he could be what we always hoped Granlin would be. Granlin, Granlin. Because he's more of a playmaker than a goal scorer, but he can score goals. He absolutely can. Uh, he dominated the OHL with 111 total points. 37 on more goals. So it's like, no. It's not like... I don't think he's Granlin where you'd be lucky to get 20 goals out of him. He might end up being a, a hell of a better player. We'll see what happens, though. Obviously, OHL is not necessarily NHL. But 111 points is a hell of a lot. Uh, he's more, he'll more than likely be gone in the top five, but we can dream. Um, some people have him drop into eight, seven. So who knows? I, I shouldn't even be saying that. That was like kind of my notes there. I shouldn't even be necessarily saying he could go top five. But he's got the kind of talent where he could. Uh, so does Marco Rossi. He's got the talent where he could go top five, this type of thing. Uh, it, there's a lot of debates going on. Uh, interesting back and forth we'll say week to week on the the soda podcast pretty cool stuff soda podcast out there 
or should I call it the Soda Pod? I just wanted to make sure I'm saying that correctly. Obviously, really cool show. I might be jumping on that one at some point. They've invited me, so we'll see if we can schedule a day. Obviously, schedules are what they are for everybody. We're all adults here, right? Schedules are difficult to get together. Hockey Podcasting Network, all that good stuff. Talk about beer, talk about hockey, all that cool stuff. <laughs> but no, they had Derek Felska on last week. Really what a great conversation. Oh, Derek, Derek, you're the best. You know, <laughs> awesome conversation with those guys, and i got to have them on this show again as well. Um, conversations about Anton Lindell versus Marco Rossi, this type of thing. And then the guest they had this week, who's uh, Tampa, uh, Tampa Bay Lightning affiliated. Good good luck to him. They might get a Stanley Cup this year. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No, <laughs> that's how that goes. But uh, that's how great they are. But um, that's just a hell of an organization. A, a back and forth, though. Obviously, it's not like the two were arguing between uh, <laughs> just just differing opinions. They didn't even you know talk about it necessarily. Nobody bantered back and forth with anyone. But uh, to get to the point, Derek Felska is very much on Marco Rossi as being a very very productive can't miss guy at number nine if the Wild are lucky enough to get him or even trade up to get him. And uh, the guest they had yesterday is on Anton Lindell. Like, if he was at nine, they need to just run up to the stage and take Anton Lindell. Where, uh, and he wasn't as excited about Marco Rossi. So it was literally a back and forth with those two, uh, the, 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 the guest back-to-back weeks. I'm actually so glad I heard that before I did this segment. Uh, interesting conversation between those two guys. Uh, and you heard uh, from... Derek Felska, that Anton Lindell, you know, he, he's kind of like the quintessential, <laughs> the typical Minnesota Wild pick. You also read the article as well. If I can get back to that here, as I'm a little distracted, unfortunately. Lots of stuff going on at once here. I apologize. Uh, Marco Rossi is gushes about. We'll get back to him in a second. But Lindell, it's like uh, people are excited about him and all that. But, you know, they're, they're comparing him to Miko Ratnan and Barkov. But at the same time, He's wondering, he's, he's, he's just not as excited about him necessarily because obviously not as fast, this and that, but he's, he's kind of like a Miko Koivu type necessarily. He's, you know, it's not like Koivu would be a bad player and Koivu was taken around that same area, like six, seven, eight, nine back in the day, officially six with Minnesota years ago. Uh, so that's kind of how that goes. You know, I mean, you're going to get, you're not necessarily going to get a franchise player here, six to nine in the NHL draft. That's just the way it goes. Uh, to me, when I watched Lindell, when I did my research, I'm kind of, I, I'd have to say I am on Derek Felska's side. It's not just because I know Derek and he's my friend and everything. I'm kind of on his side. Uh, Marco Rossi, boy, that guy uses talent. He's really something. Uh, constantly. I mean, the, the unbelievable puck handling. The guy can score and do kind of a little bit of everything. He's a lot of what Bill Guerin most likely would want. He's a 200-foot player who is just elite offensively, but he's really, really good defensively as well. He's really responsible defensively in Marco Rossi. Anton Ludell, Lindell is too, but he doesn't stand out to me like Marco Rossi. Uh, obviously, it's just a different game over there in Europe. Lindell does not dazzle, though. He, he just doesn't to me. Uh, his, when he's on the open ice, he's not that fast. He's, he's, his skating's okay. It's good, but he doesn't stand out to me like he's, he's spectacular. Um, he's obviously a bigger guy. He's strong, this type of thing. He's, he's an intelligent player. <clears throat> As we'll now jump to what uh, Derek Felska has to say. He's a top six caliber center. Who already possesses good size, strength, and the kind of attention to detail in both offensive and defensive zone that will make him a franchise mainstay for many years. Yet the caveat on this kid is whether he's going to be a scorer at the next level or is he Miku Cuevo 2.0 who teases with offensive ability but just doesn't shoot the puck nearly enough. Yet if anyone wants to talk the wild history of going with the safe pick, Lindell fits that paradigm. Um, yeah, I'm kind of on that bandwagon right there. Uh, after what I saw, I'm kind of seeing the same thing. I'm seeing the same thing Derek is. Uh, he's, it's not like he's bad. He's, he's, Lindell's going to be a legitimate player, but he might be middle six. That's the thing. He's, he's definitely no guarantee to be top six. He's capable of top six. It's kind of one of those does he want it type of things. Uh, is, is his mindset to be a top six or is his mindset to be a solid kind of, a, you know, a solid defensive-minded guy who's looking to make plays for others? There's nothing wrong with making plays for others. Uh, he did a good job, obviously, and all that. And, of course, again, the European game's a little different over there. 
but again, is he Kluivert 2.0? Uh, that's the thing. Uh, he he played in Liga last year uh, against Stenter, of course, six foot one, big guy, you know, big kind of like Koivu, this type of thing. Maybe not as big as Koivu. Koivu is pretty huge, obviously. Obviously, more assists than goals, that type of thing, and that's going to happen, of course. Marco Rossi, more assists than goals, but he just flat out dazzled. Uh, it's a different game. Again, it's slower in Europe at the moment. Gen- I mean, generally, it's just a little bit slower pace over there because that's just how it goes, more defensive-minded. You get Marco Rossi in the OHL with the Ottawa 67s. Oh, man, the guy is just oozing talent. Smaller guy, but that was kind of, you know, it's been kind of a back-and-forth thing with the small guys. You had you you had Steve Eiserman, who was spectacular. You had a lot of smaller guys in the 80s and 90s who were super good. And then it seemed to slow down and drop off, especially for a while with uh, guys like Johnny Goudreau, who's, you know, who was awesome at the beginning, but then here come the playoffs, and he just kind of disappears. Granlin just kind of disappears. And now we're coming back to, again, you can't really just shy away from the small guys because they have elite talent, some of them. I mean, a lot of them have this quickness uh, and all that, the quickness and the, and the goal-scoring capabilities. You don't want to ignore that. Uh, and Marco Rossi is in that category. Is he a Johnny Goudreau type? Is he beyond? It's hard to say, obviously. But uh, definitely, I would say Derek Krelska on the bottom line is uh, very happy with what uh, what uh, Marco Rossi could possibly bring. An elite hockey mind that possesses that that processes quickly. Yeah, yeah, obviously a very intelligent guy. And has the ability to both set up teammates and has terrific goal scoring instincts. Yes, he does. Yeah, from what I saw, terrific goal scoring instincts of his uh, of his own, while also being defensively responsible too. Sounds good, too good to be true. But Rossi's small size may have him drop to number nine where the Wild can get that elusive center with speed scoring ability they've always coveted. Um, yeah, yeah, he's he's got more speed than Anton Lindell. Put it that way, he certainly does, and his stick handling is ridiculous. Uh, it really is. Uh, there's there's something special with Marco Rossi. I think. I uh, but our our other team is going to take him earlier. Again, he's been often projected higher. Unfortunately, the number nine. But maybe. And if he winds up with the Minnesota Wild, that'd be absolutely uh, awesome. If it's me, if it's basically, if I had a choice between Rossi and Lindell, I'm going to go with Marco Rossi. I don't see Mikhail Granlund here. I think he's better than Mikhail Granlund. Granlund. I do. Obviously, he's from Austria, and he was playing with the Ottawa 67s. 120 points, 39 of them goals. 39 of them goals. So he's one of those kind of centers that, yeah, he, he gets a billion assists. I mean, he got 81 assists, but 39 goals, too. And they're not the kind of goals where you're just like, yeah, well, you know, he's scoring in the OHL. Who cares? They look like NHL goals to me. That's what I like about Marco Rossi. I mean, he looks like somebody that would score in the NHL on a regular basis, not just here and there. You know, he'll he'll get his he'll get his eighteen to twenty five goals. It's not bad, but it's certainly not franchise changing necessarily. And you know, he'll 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 get about sixty points a year. He's Pierre Marc Bouchard. He's Mikhail Granlin. Uh, this and that, but uh, I think he's going to be better than both of those guys. To be quite honest, I I, I really do. Quinn and Byfield's like a dream, obviously, but <laughs> you'd have to trade up to number two to get him, probably. Lindell, if he's the pick, I'm not going to groan and get pissed off, but at the same time, I'm not going to be super excited. I'd, I'd rather have Marco Rossi if we could. Cole Perfetti also is another very intriguing player. Saginaw Spirit, again, I talked about him a little bit earlier, but I like him. I, I like Cole Perfetti quite a bit. Anton Lindell would be nice to see if he does reach his potential, but... I don't know, at the end of the day. I don't know how excited you can get about that one, necessarily. Um, Derek Felska actually didn't cover Cole Perfetti in this one because he probably figured he's going to go higher, and I don't blame him for that. Uh, to me, Cole Perfetti is basically, in a lot of ways, what we wished and hoped that Mikhail Granlund was. And if I, if there is Cole Perfetti in here, I deeply apologize to Derek because I'm not seeing him. And yeah, he was saying, basically, we were talking about players that will possibly be available. Perfetti was projected to go much higher now he's floating around, like 8, 9. So that's why I'm talking about him here. And again, that's how I see him. He reminds me of Mikhail Granlin, but better. Like a better, legitimate, goal-scoring type of a threat. Uh, second off spirit, 37 goals, 37 assists. So again, uh, he's got serious goal-scoring ability to go along with his playmaking ability. Uh, playmaking ability. Uh, it's definitely there. Definitely a little bit of everything with this guy. 
Uh, again, teammates with Damien Giroux, outstanding playmaker, this and that. Um, again, I, I love what uh, Cole Perfetti could potentially be for the Minnesota Wild going forward. Then you look at defensemen a little bit because we might be heading that way. Again, what if all the forwards just get gobbled up? What if Perfetti, Lindell, all of them are gone? Even Lindell goes to Buffalo, which wouldn't surprise me, actually. He just Anton Lindell just sounds like a Buffalo Sabre, doesn't he? <laughs> Cole Perfetti sounds like a Ottawa Senator or a Detroit Red Wing. That's what they're, they're even projecting him to go as high as the Detroit Red Wings. Marco Rossi to the Ducks? Yeah, ish. That would be nasty. Um, that would suck. Yeah, certain mock drafts have Perfetti going as high as four. Marco Rossi's often, often floating around six to nine. Maybe even five to Ottawa, but I don't know. You got, you got Seth Jarvis. Dylan Holloway is a possibility. Partially if you trade down. Of course, they have him going on this. My NHL draft all the way down to 19. I don't know if I agree with that one. That's a little low. 19 to the Calgary Flames. I think they'd be happy to get him, but we'll see. Uh, and now it looks like the draft is going to be kind of in a random time. Uh, October the 6th. Tuesday, October the 6th. Derek was the first one to kind of tell me about the timing. I have often I was going to look it up, obviously, because it's still coming. But, you know, it's not like it's super close. We're still in the postseason. But it's like, yeah, Tuesday and Wednesday. That's kind of weird. So, But I'm going to take some time off work because, damn it, damn it, I'm watching that. You, you know I'm going to watch that. <laughs> it's just no question about it. Yeah, this was, that's this particular mock draft is about a week ago. So, you know, things go up and down and this and that. And they change their mind. And I don't know. The, the creators of the website might be a little random here and there. But the can, the guy I'm seeing most often coming to Minnesota, number nine right now, is Anton Lindell. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not, again, I wouldn't be furious, but it's not going to jump me out of my seat. You know, I'm, I'm not going to get projected right out of my seat. It's just not going to happen, unfortunately. Uh, Askarov, if the Wild took Askarov, it's like, okay, you know, I, I get it. I wouldn't be very excited either necessarily, but in time I would be. And if he doesn't pan out, then it's a oh, then it's a dis, uh, very disappointing pick, particularly if Marco Rossi's there. If Rossi's there and you take the goalie, that'd be crazy. But for me, Marco Rossi's the guy that I would want the most. Cole Perfetti second, Lundell third, maybe. <laughs> and then, I mean, you have all these wingers, though, that are more than capable of doing something that have been floating around. Seth Jarvis. I even like Jake Sanderson and, of course, uh, I, I really like Jamie Drysdale. He's been floating around all over the place as well. Oftentimes actually going ahead of the wild. And he's a right shot defenseman. So it depends on how things are going with uh, Brennan Mendel. And if you're going to trade away Matt Dumba. Again, uh, King Clancy winner. Congratulations to that. Uh, congratulations winning the King Clancy. Back-to-back years a wild player winning. Will it be back-to-back years that the King Clancy players traded? That'd be funny because, of course, you had Jason Zucker going to the Pittsburgh Penguins. You still have Kalen Addison as a future right shot defenseman. You still have Spurgeon and Dumba. So Spurgeon, Dumba, Kalen Addison per se. Uh, otherwise, uh, you've had Brad Hunt playing out of position the whole season, right, right shot, but he's still very capable of doing that. You got Greg Pattern, who, I don't know, maybe he's like a de facto seventh defenseman until his contract's up at the end of the season. Because, uh, I don't know, you, you can only buy out one or two guys at, at most because you're going to clog up that dead cap space. That would be really kind of dumb if you do that. So, and obviously most GMs are like, hell no. It sucks to think that you have like three guys on the roster that you'd like to buy out today, if you could. Today! <laughs> Devin Dubnik you'd like to buy out, partially because, I mean, though I think he's a guy you could possibly trade, possibly. Even if it's for a seventh round pick, who cares? It's, you know, it, you know, it's not going to kill you to trade him. It's not. Uh, you have your friend by the name of uh, Victor Rask. Victor Rask, of course, he's uh, a huge bio candidate, but unfortunately, again, he's, you know, he would clog up a bit. It would be like $2 million ish on the books for a while. Unfortunately, for about four years, he would have dead cap on the books for about four years. It wouldn't be quite $2 million. It would be like, it would be more the first year, and then the next couple of years it would be like one point three, and then a smaller amount after that in the fourth year. That's usually how that kind of thing works, but still, four bleeping years, you'd have uh, dead cap from him. And again, uh, Mr. Pattern, you'd have two years of dead cap, about mm, like a million and a half. It wouldn't be the end of the world, but if you do it two or three times in the same summer, that'd be kind of insane. So you know that's not going to happen. The most likely guy to get bought out is Victor Rask, and unfortunately, again, his would be the longest. So 
it is what it is. Four million for Victor Ask. Oh, that hurts. That hurts. And it's still it still pills in comparison to the setting of Matt Zuccarello when you think about just even the the thought of buying him out. I mean, you would be talking ten years of dead cap. <laughs> yeah, ten years of dead cap. Doesn't that sound great? That sounds great, doesn't it? Ten years of dead cap. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that would be dumb. That'd be really dumb. Seth Jarvis, right winger. Another possibility, of course, the Wild have a need at right wing. There's no question about that. Uh, Keith ranked third on Derek Felska's possible uh, forwards here. His bottom line on him is a competitive right shot center, right wing. So he can play center as well, which is really nice to know. Um, he can score, but also contributes defensively. That's good. He is kind of a sneaky good scorer and has the ability to take over a game. He kind of reminds me of Anthony Boyviller. And I've heard others make comparisons to Mitch Marner, which is obviously <laughs> quite complimentary. Jarvis is the kind of player who makes teammates better and gives you great effort at both ends of the ice. And again, do check out this article as well from Derek Felska. Uh, awesome stuff. For the Portland Winter Hawks, that was like a movie back in the day, Winter Hawks in the 70s, WHL. 98 points, 42 goals, 46 assists. So there you go. And this is a guy who's a year younger did not have Beckman, so who knows what kind of numbers he might put up next year in the Western Hockey League. Seth Jarvis, so it's a possibility, it's a possibility. They have him listed as just the right wing here, but it sounds like he can play center as well, which would be really nice. Well, and yes, right wing has been a position of need as well. It's not just center, but center is obviously the most important position besides goaltender when it comes to the National Hockey League. And unfortunately, goalies take forever to develop. Again, you have guys in the system that I think could be long-term solutions. At least one uh, Cabo Kakinen, I think, is, is the, in, an immediate possible long-term solution, at least to be a platoon or, you know, like a backup, but gets plenty of plenty of games between the pipes, which is why I come up with the word platoon when I talk about uh, Cabo Kakinen possibly platooning with uh, Alex Stalock or somebody like a Cam Talbot, somebody like that, uh, you know, a stopgap type of guy come in and be solid for you. Maybe you never know. Maybe he win a playoff series for you, which unfortunately he couldn't do against the Dallas Stars. And well, <laughs> Stars ended up doing a lot more than uh, I expected. That's for sure. Whew. Yeah, a lot more than I expected. Regardless, um, Jake Sanderson though he's a, he's a, he's an option at the left wing position, left defenseman. Pardon me, left left shot defenseman. He's a pretty good skater, pretty good stick handler, this and that. Uh, he's got a nice release on his wrister and all that, and maybe a need of that left shot guy, potentially, obviously, because that's getting a little thinner now uh, in the wild system. Before, we were just absolutely too full there, and there were certain guys, you know, just dying to get that third third left defenseman position, and it's just, you know, it just was always filled. It was always filled by somebody. You had Gustav Olofsson, you had Carson Soucy, yeah, Nick Sealer. There was three guys trying to get there. None of them were great. It's just that they were all at least guys that probably deserved a crack at the NHL. And then, you know, Sealer obviously took over early when Brodeen got injured. He was very surprising and all that. Then he dropped off when the Wild made the weird move for, uh, or should I just say, Paul Fenton made the weird move to get a Tony Batero in, in the system. And, yeah, that really messed everything up. Tony Batero took over that third left defenseman spot, and it wasn't good at all. That messed things up for Nick Steeler. Uh, Carson Soucy's surprise later on was really, really positive. And then Steeler just kind of vanished off the face of the earth and wound up getting traded to the Blackhawks, which is really sad, you know, considering how good he was for Minnesota. Uh, he was even on the second pairing for a while, was Nick Steeler. That was shockingly good, good stuff. And, of course, Gustav Olsen couldn't stay healthy for his life, and he was traded a while ago, about two years ago already. Hard to believe, right before... Uh, I, I, it was one of Paul Fenton's first moves, actually was trading away the Goots, Gustav Olofsson. So now you have uh, Jake Sanderson heading to the University of North Dakota, which obviously is one of the one of the most proud uh, college hockey programs in the country. Obviously the numbers aren't going to be that spectacular. He's been super, he's super young. He played on the national under-18 team. Still got 29 points, though, seven of them goals. He has goal-scoring capability, and of course he's able to move the puck very, very nicely. And then, of course, the better version is up above potentially going well ahead of the Wild, Jamie Drysdale. Right shot defensive for the Erie Otters. 
he's got some serious skill, I think. Uh, a little Kalen Addison in him, possibly. Maybe even better. It might end up being better than Kalen Addison. Um, so, he could be your future number one defense, and possibly. And, you know, it, he's not going to be with the Wild for a few years. That's a, that's a given. 47 points in 49 games. That's just sick. Nine of them goals. OHL's eerie honors. A team that struggled for a little while, but you got to think they've been getting better with some of these awesome prospects floating around at that uh, that 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 uh, major junior club, Drysdale. Though that's a it's an exciting possibility there. Very exciting. Uh, again, like a better version of what Jake Sanderson brings. Again, the yeah, he's a good skater. This Drysdale, and obviously just a sound sound uh, neutral zone defender as well. Uh, loved what I saw from him. Uh, making the, knocking the puck away, this and that, and just flat out shutting guys down without having to make a whole lot of contact. Just really good at the stick, taking the puck away and all that. Uh, Drysdale, I, I, I liked what I saw uh, during my research and watching videos and such on him. Uh, I wouldn't mind. I wouldn't mind. And again, it's it's all how you view Dumba. It's all how you view Brodeen. It's all, I mean, you just stand pat and keep them both long term. Kalen Addison, obviously, uh, you didn't trade for him if you didn't think he had serious potential, this and that, because you traded away a pretty good player to get him. Uh, and the odds of keeping Gulch and Yuck are almost impossible. Uh, and, and, of course, the Minnesota Wild just made an acquisition. Very nice read also by Derek Falska, but, you know, and uh, Nick Bustad, for a former gopher coming to Minnesota. Huge, 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 huge guy. Not sure what his role is going to be. I know Derek wasn't all too uh, enthralled with it either, because it's like, I don't know. I mean, I guess he replaces Galchenyuk from the Pittsburgh Penguins again. So, we're the Minnesota Penguins. We were the Minnesota Predators for two years. Now that we're the Minnesota Wild Penguins, we're the, we're the Wild Penguins. It's, it's a green penguin, and it's a little angrier looking, right? Even though Pittsburgh's got four cups, and we're still looking to get to our second Western Conference Final. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but we're the Wild Penguins, I guess. The, the Northern Penguins. And um, Nick Bukestad obviously was solid with the Gophers. This and that didn't didn't explode. This and that he was he was decent. Didn't and, and then in the NHL he was solid with the Panthers. This and that he's played some center. He's played some right wing, and he could play right wing with Minnesota as well. So it's like like if we can do better at center per se, he doesn't necessarily have to play there. But it just reeks of like it's you know Galchenyuk again, kind of in a way. In a way, uh, that's the unfortunate part, but. It's not like I hate the move, but it's not like I love the move either. So, I mean, just kind of generally speaking, big, huge guy, lots of potential. That's why Florida liked him. They took him in the first round, but unfortunately he hasn't, you know, he hasn't reached the potential over the years, and he's 28 already, so I don't know about reaching any potential at this stage. <sighs> mm, bummer. Uh Definitely has had some moments. He did have a 49-point season just a couple of years ago, 2017-2018. So 19 of those were goals, uh, and he played in 82 games in that case. So very solid. Now he's been off-injured pretty much ever since coming to the, uh, the Pittsburgh Penguins. He's been kind of off-injured, this and that. Last year he only played 13 games and only eight or only two points in the 13 games. So very uh, invisible in that case. Six foot six though, and we'll see. We'll see what happens. I mean, he's going to be on Minnesota. He's played zero time in the AHL, which is pretty crazy when you think about it. Just went from college to pro, and uh, good for him. So I don't think he's going to be on the Iowa Wild, but maybe maybe he'll get a cup of coffee there if, if that's the case at the end of the day. So uh, conditional seventh-round pick, this and that, with uh, the Pittsburgh Penguins leading into 2021. So we'll have to see where that goes. As for free agency, it's kind of, you know, free agency doesn't excite me like it did in the past, but maybe you can get a nice stopgap goaltender. That's the one thing. I mean, you have some interesting goalies available. Uh, heck, even Alex Pietrangelo is available, but i got to think he's going to stay with the uh, St. Louis Blues. Mikhail Granlin's available. How much is he going to want, this and that? And would you, would you want to bring him back? Talk is that we probably won't. Uh, Ryan Nugent Hopkins is probably looking at a, a uh, you know a significant raise, maybe eight million a year for five years, something like that, and watch him get a no move clause as well. We don't like those words around here. Taylor Hall is an unrestricted free agent, still twenty eight. So yeah, I don't think we're going to be having the cap space to sign him. I really don't. Miko Koivu is a UFA, of course, and he's not coming back. <sighs> Tory Krug, let's let's go. Tory Krug, let's go. Five foot nine defenseman, bring him into Minnesota. <laughs> no, I don't think we're going to be able to do that either. 
there's interesting ones. Jimmy Howard, I don't think Wild would go that direction to stopgap. 36-year-old, you kind of already, you know, I don't know, he's way too way too old at this point, I think, and he had a drop-off. Martin Hansel, I wouldn't want to even touch him with a 35-and-a-half-foot pole. I just wouldn't. In free agency, I think it's goaltending. I, I really do, and maybe maybe some kind of a depth guy, some kind of a you know middle six, bottom bottom six type of guy. At the end of the day, just like that's kind of our free agency historically. Uh, obviously, goaltending though, uh, Braden, Braden Holtby again could be like a stopgap, Cam Talbot type of type of guy. He's only thirty one, but he's dropped off quickly, man. What what happened? What happened? What happened to Braden Holtby? Yikes! He won the Stanley Cup just a couple just two years ago. I I don't know. And then he got an exciting backup named Grubauer, and he's been great for Colorado, but then he got injured, and, well, they lost, unfortunately. And they almost won, but they lost. Corey Crawford's 35. He's awesome. He's a wild killer, this and that. He was an absolute wild killer forever in the postseason. 35, but when healthy, he's damn good. And like a one- or two-year contract to kind of work with Capo Kakinen, platoon, or even be even be Capo's backup next year, if uh, you know, the year after next, so to speak, if uh, Capo ends up becoming a legitimate starter in the NHL. It's, you know, I don't think he would be the angriest guy in the world if that took place. I just don't. Uh, generally, free agency doesn't excite me a whole lot unless you really, really got something going. It's going to be a trade. Somehow, some way of the Wild are going to make some kind of immediate uh, move to get like a legitimate center, top six type of guy because this current roster at the center position is, it's not, I wouldn't call it laughable, I'd call it frightening. It, it's scary. Uh, it's freaking scary. And if Nick Bustad is uh, the best you got, boy. You know, well, the second best you got, then, boy. Uh, obviously, there's hope with Jewel Erickson Eck, but he's never really shown legitimate cor- uh, scoring touch. He has shown scoring touch in the AHL, though, to be fair. So it depends on who he's playing with at the same time. Maybe if you do pair him with, you know, and this has been talked about on other shows out there, I believe with uh, even, like, Russo and such, and, and on, uh, I believe it was on Sound the Foghorn, uh, they talked about uh, possibly putting uh, Jewel Erickson Eck with Fiala and Koprizov and see what happens. Maybe his production just explodes. Obviously, he'd certainly get plenty of assists. Uh, would he be able to? Would he be able to fit with them? I mean, it's a possibility. I think it was mostly Russo and uh, Anthony Lapanta talking about that on that show. The you know the the Russo show with Talk North. There, uh, interesting thought process there. No question about that. I would. Uh, not be against it. I mean, at least see what happens. Give him a shot. Obviously, there's been lots of frustration with guys in the system. Like, why can't they get a crack to at least be on the second power play unit or something when nobody else is scoring, like the Coils, like the Niederreiters for so long, or so inconsistent. Give the Sam Honest a chance. Give the, you know, give this guy a chance. Give that guy a chance. And then ultimately, Brennan Mendel as well to spark something, this and that. Make some kind of move. And now Brennan Mendel's frustrated, and he probably was a little too impatient at the same time as well, because I think he would have gotten a shot at the NHL, especially with the possibility of a trade, which would have been totally fine with me. Heck, and now I was unable to write the article with him moving to the KHL. I had started a nice article about who would be a wise trade. I was going with Dumba because you have Kalen Addison and Brennan Mendel down there saying, hello, 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 anybody there? Let us go, (laughs) let us up to the NHL already. We're not, and we're, and we're not third pairing. We're second pairing type of guys. At least, at least one of us should be. And you even have Louis Belpedia, who is a third pairing type of guy, who I think would be very solid. Uh, I don't hate him, but the fact that uh, the Wild traded with Tampa to uh, move down one spot to let uh, Tampa Bay Lightning take Braden Point, which I failed to say properly on the last episode, that one's a, a heartbreaker. No question about that. But uh, still, I do. Th- I still b- believe that. Uh, Louis Belpedio is at least a third pairing defenseman in the NHL. Obviously, Braden Point and Louis Belpedio, there's no comparison at this stage. No, no, no comparison. Um, goaltender, though, yeah, you're looking at. I mean, for me, it's between Crawford, uh, Crawford and Thomas Grace from Germany there. Obviously, New York Islanders uh, hero in the postseason, winning game seven in the second round. I would love to have Thomas Grace with the Wild. Again, another stopgap, kind of hold hold down the fort for, for a couple of years with Minnesota. Everywhere he's gone, he's been solid. Uh, his numbers aren't spectacular, but he's solid. He's not a starter, but he can start. He can start for a, for like a year or half a year, this and that, as a uh, Kapokakin, and hopefully 
moved up into the uh, into the rankings. Another guy the Wild should absolutely look at, as long as he's not looking for a massive raise, and I don't know if he can at this point, is Eric Halla. Uh Cameron Talbot as well. Cam Talbot, Calgary, right on top of each other here in the free agent market. Uh, both of them, Eric Halla and Cam Talbot, are two guys I would consider. Of course, Talbot, the goalie for Calgary last year, was really good down the stretch, helping Calgary almost beat the Dallas Stars. Just the guys in front of Cam Talbot didn't help him very much. And uh, I'm not a British fan. I don't like Riddish very much with Calgary. He's so freaking inconsistent. I don't like him, man. Uh, Eric Hall is already 29 years of age, unfortunately. He was teammates with Nick Bukestad. Um, and Hall actually led the team in scoring when Bukestad was the actual number one pick, uh, the first uh, first round pick for the uh, on the goal for his first round pick, ultimately for Florida. And then Eric Hall was only a seventh round pick, and Hall had more points. It's kind of funny when you think about that. I would not be against bringing Eric Hall back, and hopefully acquiring uh, Nick Bukes, that didn't kill that. Hopefully it didn't, because Eric Hall, that would be, uh, man, I, I think it'd be a nice fit, and I think he'd work well with uh, uh, Dean Evison. Dean Evison's style. I think he'd work better with him than possibly with uh, Bruce Budo. It, it's a crying shame, because Hall was freaking awesome with uh, Torchetti. Him and Torchetti was like a perfect match, and then Torchetti was gone right away. Yeah, that was kind of a bummer, so I don't know. <sighs> boy, oh boy. Yep. But yep, Anton Hudobin's going to be a free agent as well. That's a guy who's been unbelievable. Unbelievable. Former Minnesota Wild player many years ago. And man, he's been good everywhere he's gone, hasn't he? He was actually good with the Minnesota Wild with the time he was with the Minnesota Wild years ago and the couple games he got to play with us. Uh, I like him a lot. and Good for him, this and that. Torrey Perry's back on the market, this and that. That's just kind of funny. But Thomas Grice, Cam Talbot, those are my top choices. Corey Crawford would be good, too, even though he's old and oft injured. That's the scary part with him. Um, but when he's good, he's awesome. Uh, and Eric Hall, guys like that, possibly. Uh, Mikhail Granlin, some people. I'm thinking, no. Don't don't, don't get Granlin. You're kind of bringing back that same vibe in the locker room that I'm sure uh, Mr. Bill Garrett doesn't want to bring back. It's not personal. It's business. Seriously. That's why Quavo's not coming back. It's not personal, it's business. we got to just change the vibe. It's not like it was a bad vibe, it just wasn't a championship vibe. It just wasn't. It was just a playoff vibe. Playoffs and and that's it. Losing the first round vibe. So that's kind of my take there. That's kind of how I look at free agency. Uh, little kind of tweaks to help the team get better. Possibly look to make the big trade. So a guy like Sorelli, this and that. You're not going to get some of the big, you know, you're not going to make a big free agent splash, obviously. Uh, you just, how how are you going to do that? So that's just how that goes. And of course, the draft again. Looking at Rossi, Cole Perfetti, um, Drysdale would be very exciting. I think you're reaching a little bit to take Jake Sanderson ninth overall. But unless you really got a feeling, I, I think you're reaching a little bit. Maybe a trade down if you're if you're thinking that way. Maybe you're just not impressed with uh, taking somebody at nine, but you trade down to get the same guy at eleven, twelve, something like that. Uh, like a Dylan Holloway, like a Jake Sanderson, somebody like that at the end of the day. With that, I'll give the <laughs> I'll take a quick break and we will return for fan interaction. <laughs> here on Brave the Wild, segment number three, going to get into fan interaction, very exciting here again, State of the Wild 2020, going to do a little addendum and errata really quick first before I jump into the fan interaction, of course, so this show is a big project every year, and generally it happens in June, this and that, so things go a little more smoothly, so to speak, with the Stanley Cup final and the draft and all that, this year things are kind of bunched together, uh, very closely, so it's like the finals end and here's the draft and here's free agency. Oh, yeah, and buyouts happen, too, like almost right after the the NHL, uh, the Stanley Cup final, so to speak. So, in normal cases, I would do the show after the Stanley Cup final and all that. Uh, this year, well, game one has taken place. So far, Dallas looks a lot better than Tampa, but it's just one game, and we all know the Minnesota North Stars beat the Pittsburgh Penguins in 1991, and 
They even won game number three to take a two to one lead, and then and then Pittsburgh just came in and absolutely destroyed the North Stars after that. It was the most depressing thing ever. Uh, we'll see if Tampa has the same response because they're kind of they're kind of early '90s Penguin like. They have a lot of stars. They don't have Mario Lemieux. Well, Kucherov's pretty damn good. Their goalie's probably a little better than Barrasso. They have everything. They have a little bit of everything. We'll see, though. Uh, Dallas off to a great start, and they've had a great run to the Cup Final again. So I previewed the Stanley Cup Final on the last show that I did just a couple of days ago, and I talked about Nick Bustad. I talked about, uh, <laughs> you know, the uh, Coivo retirement, Jonas Burdine seven-year extension. So do check that out if you haven't yet. I apologize that these shows are too close together a little bit. I anticipated waiting until after the Cup Final, and it's like, you know what? I don't know. I uh, had a conversation with some, let's just say, close confidants regarding the, uh, you know, the Minnesota Wild and all that, my friends out there <laughs> and such. And it's just like, um, eh, you know, it's, it's just a different situation. It'd be too close to the draft to release the show. It'd be like, okay, here's my draft preview, so to speak, like in segment number two. And then, oh, yeah, and the draft's happening today. You know, that's kind of lame. Or like two days later or something. It's too fast. So I'll give people a little time to enjoy it, let the show bleed out and get some value to it. So that's the approach there. And, of course, again, Miko Koivu retiring, we know, uh, obviously, it was kind of a matter of time and how it got announced and everything. It is what it is. Nothing bad. No bad blood, I'm hoping. And, of course, he will be heading into the front office or maybe to <laughs> to Finland for a year or two. We'll see what happens. Wrap things up there. Maybe come back to be in the front office or assistant coach or player development. Who knows? He's going to be something, possibly, if he wants it. I'm sure the job will be there. Bill Guerin basically has an open invitation to him, so that's pretty cool. Nick Bustad, again, brings depth to the roster if he's healthy. And maybe more. We'll see. And of course, Jonas Brodine signing long-term with the Minnesota Wild is a very good thing. And it opens the door to possibly trading Matt Dumba, this and that, which will probably lead into some of the questions coming up. The other thing I need to apologize for, well, then again, I'm just going to say this also again. The show, generally speaking, when I do this, it's a project. And obviously the segments are not recorded on the same day, generally. Sometimes they are, if it's just the right time, right place, or if it's like time to record and I haven't gotten to it, that type of thing which uh, was the case of Purple Mafia this year quite a bit. I just got rolling. I had to move um, for the uh, season preview situation. But in this case, again, it's a project show. Some of the segments were recorded a while ago. Not super long ago, but long enough ago, we'll say, that news has happened in between the segments. So that will explain why certain things hadn't happened yet when in real life they've happened in the they've happened already that type of thing so hope you understand that that's just how it goes sometimes and again again it's a unique year so that's how that's how the cookie crumbles in on planet earth i suppose things just get weirder every year uh facebook page we'll talk about that for like a half a second basically not really any comments it's mostly just likes and shares here and there and i appreciate those of you that do that but nobody comments on there i don't know why it's very inactive in that sense uh, I post things, and there's just not as much activity, but Twitter is a different story. Facebook.com forward slash BraveTheWild.Minnesota. Got that out of the way. I'll put that in the show description. I'm just going to literally click close on that, because it's just what's the point of having that up and in the way. Uh, so Twitter, that's the big that's the big, <laughs> big link to Brave the Wild pretty much on social media. At Brave the Wild, at Brave the Wild, and of course my actual personal account is at Paladino Live. Both of those will be in the show description. That one I just kind of left dormant forever. Uh, it was always there, I just didn't use it. And then it's like, when I became a writer with Gone Puck Wild, it's like, I probably should put that one, shouldn't I? Because I know just basically everybody else has their own uh, Twitter account separated from their show, this and that. So I guess just, <laughs> I mean, that Twitter account's been active for 10 years, it's just been sitting there. So you get the idea there. I apologize for the weirdness and all that, so I wanted to get the addendum and errata out of the way before I got cracking here. Hashtag BTWMN for questions, comments, and all that good stuff. Getting some conversation on the show. Always thank Derek Felska. What a great idea. Yeah, that's why I consider him a close confidant when it comes to Brave the Wild. He's a great guy, obviously. He writes for Crease and Assist. I, I believe I shouted out to him already on the show, but I'm going to keep shouting out to him because he's the greatest. Uh, at Crease and Assist, he uh, is definitely an, another inspiration for me, <laughs> among many. But, I mean, he's, he's a very close one, we'll say right now lately when it comes to, uh, you know, writing about the Wild, being able to write about the Minnesota Wild. Uh, I used to write about the Timberwolves many years ago, so I'm very excited to have joined uh, Gone Puck Wild. And, of course, Derek Felska writes for Crease and Assist. That's actually his page, literally his page, Crease and Assist. Look that up. Just Google it. You'll find it right away. 
and at Crease and Assist is the Twitter. You'll be able to get all kinds of awesome, wild conversation, wild news, wild articles, and there you go. So hashtag BTWMN. Let's get that. Let, let let's get the show on the road. And of course, I'm getting caught up because the last few shows there was no uh, questions, so I just let it pile up. So we're gonna empty the bag now. Chris Frost. Chris Frost shared from Derek Felska says. I had the same question. Was looking at draft boards, and Marco Rossi comes up in the number nine spot. Worth it? Yes. <laughs> segment, uh, according to segment number two, anyway, <laughs> as I talked about, yes. Marco Rossi would be my pick, actually. If he's there, he is my guy. Unless uh, Quinton Byfield's sitting there. Uh, Drysdale's a guy I would strongly consider. I really like him. I really like Drysdale. Uh, we're seeing some other mocks out there that have the wild... Let's see, where is he? Boy, he's... These mocks are all over the place. You just oh, uh, Sanderson. They have the wild taking Jake Sanderson. Actually, just tenth in this case. This current one that's updated recently. They have the wild taking Dawson Mercer. Okay, right wing uh, from the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League, Drummondale, Drummondville. Pardon me. Um, Jake Sanderson. He's kind of raw. I, I like him, and I talked about him on the previous segment. He's kind of raw. But Marco Rossi would be my pick. This one is the Buffalo Sabres taking Marco Rossi. Oh, so you take you take Eric Stahl and Marco Rossi. What the hell? No, <laughs> no, uh, it's time. And yep, that was the other conversation. Eric Stahl for Marcus uh, Johansson. I'm a, I'm a fan. It's, it's a good move in terms of it's time to move on, and we'll see what happens with Johansson. It's not a long-term commitment, and if he's a perfect fit for us, he'll get some kind of a commitment. I'm sure he will. Hopefully not seven years and six million per or anything, but <laughs> I don't think he's on Jonas Brodeen's level, but we'll see. Anton Lindell drops all the way to 14th. That's another name that's been debated all over the place. Him versus Rossi, and I take Rossi between those two. I see skill on that guy. I keep trying to figure out who the heck to compare him to. He's just got skill. He's kind of unique in a lot of ways, but he reminds me of a lot of people, but I can't pinpoint who who comes out this and that. I want to say Goudreau, but maybe he'll be better. I don't know. I mean, Goudreau's obviously an awesome player. He's had a 90-point season, so... But he bothers me in the playoffs. He seems to kind of disappear, though, this year. He lose a little better. Let's keep going. Tom Hayen. Uh, this was, oh, this was earlier, I believe. I probably read this one. I think he said, yep, nope, he was just sharing something. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, he was sharing the show. I appreciate that a lot. That one's really up. So oh, the bag. Some of these go from go way back into, like, the spring, which obviously I read on previous shows. Other ones disappeared from back then. Yeah, that one's from way back. Okay, back to August here. Derek Velska, what is your fondest NHL overtime memory? NHL overtime memory. You mean like going into overtime? Or on the show itself? Uh, mm, sometimes I don't really keep up with the post-game show. Sometimes I do, if that's what it meant, what you meant. Obviously, seeing Koivu winning games in the shootouts against Dallas more than once. Very memorable. He's just been a Dallas killer in the shootouts, but that's not even overtime. Obviously, got the postseason, but I think he means the show. I just, you know, who I, I, I just miss, <laughs> dare I say, I miss Jeremy Roenick. Let's just leave it like that, I guess. I miss Jeremy Roenick, if you mean the show. I miss him. Uh, he was fun. He was entertaining. He's, I guess he said something that somebody didn't like in the past, and now he's not on there anymore. Uh, I don't know. It's just the world's filled with, you can't say anything anymore. It, it's Kind of silly, isn't it? It seems like we're just shutting everybody down and firing everybody over everything. I'm not a Mike. I'm not a Mike Milbury hater. I'm not. I mean, maybe he's a little too crusty and gruff and all that for everybody. For 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 a lot of people, I don't hate him. I, I think he's fine. I think people give him a hard time. I, I don't hate him. I, I don't love him either. Jeremy Roenick was really fun. He's a little goofy, a little off the wall, sometimes a little too much. So yeah, he's not this perfect guy, but I miss him. So we'll leave it at that. Uh, NBC Sports. Network and you know and this and that. I'm guessing that's what you meant. And again, apologize for the late uh, reply for some of these late uh, emptying of the mail back for some of these. September. Here we go. So it's going to be a little random with some of the <laughs> dates on some of these because it is what it is. Minnesota Nice, I believe she follows. Thank you very much, and she replied to both of us and Derek kind enough to share it so I could get it right there. So it's more organized. Thank you, thank you, Derek. That's awesome. If you could make one change. What would be your dream roster move? Ignore all contracts and constrictions that we are currently bound to and cap restrictions. There's no rules in dreams. 
One change. One change. <laughs> Trade Eric Stahl for... Uh, <laughs> Uh, is it okay to say it? Uh, Connor McDavid? Is that okay? Can I trade Eric Stahl for Connor McDavid? Is that okay? Or how, uh, how about Richter Rast for Connor McDavid? It's just kind of like one of those type of things. Uh, that would be a dream roster move. No, no restrictions or anything like that. But then again, I'm guessing you mean something realistic in terms of like the other team would do it. But you don't, you know, you don't have to worry about money, this and that. But that would be the greatest ever. Uh, geez, that's really tough. I would have loved to have Marion Gabrick back when he was the younger. Some type of deal for him instead of maybe instead of Pominville. That would have been a beautiful one because that was happening around the same time. And Gabrick led the Kings to the Cup Championship. He had a beautiful playoff run that reminded you of 03, but even better. Absolutely crazy for him. Otherwise, a more simple one, if we could literally get... It's nothing personal, it's business. Get rid of Parisian suitors' contracts. Wouldn't that be nice? Maybe like restructure them, that type of thing, where... You know, Suter's obviously super valuable, but we don't want the cap hit for, of seven point. You know, of, was it seven point five for the next five, six years? For the next five years or so, it's ridiculous. So that would be nice. That'd probably be a great roster move. That type of thing. Probably Parisi's ahead of Suter because Suter's value is insane. He seems to be hanging in there longer. Parisi, like I said multiple times during this late summer, early fall season, the postseason and such, Parisi looked like he aged like five years. I, I don't know what happened, but he looked way, way, way older. I, I don't know why, but he did. Like, remember 2009, Brett Favre versus 2010, Brett Favre. Did he not look about 5 to 10 years older? And that's kind of how I felt about Zach Parisi this year. I don't know what it is, but again, oh man, yep, again, it's 5 years remaining, 7.5, same with Suter. I would say if we could remove that contract, maybe, or restructure it, where he's resigned for... Where he's here for maybe two more years, like three million per, something like that. I, I can handle that. Or even better, better yet, just void Zuccarello's contract. Just void it. Eh, no cap at all. No cap hit at all. He's gone. Bye, bye, Mets. That, that's almost even better. Almost. But either one of those is insane. Uh, Parisi's is longer by one more year, and it's 1.5 million higher. So, yeah. Yeah, there's a that the roster moves like that would be really helpful for this team. Then you could free up some cap space because obviously some players want to come here. It's not like it's a junkyard. This is not a junkyard when it comes to the National Hockey League. Sometimes you think Florida is, and then guys go there for big contracts because they get offered big contracts. Uh, sorry for babbling, but uh, yeah, that was a, it's a lot to think about. Obviously, with that type of a question, there's a lot to think about it. It's fun. It's fun to dream. Uh, it'd be nice to get rid of at least one of those two contracts, if it's one, one, like you said, one change, right? Minnesota nice. So one would be, boy. Oh man, probably the Zuccarello's contract. It's freaking no move bull crap. But then again, either one of those two, either one of those two, I'd say. Uh, Parisi brings more value than Zuccarello. So I'll go with Zuccarello's contract. Just void it. Just void it. As lame as that might seem, rather than acquiring Connor McDavid, trade Connor McDavid. Yeah, if there's no rules, Zuccarello. Okay. Long story longer. Jay Bushy, welcome back to the show, my friend. Awesome to hear from you. Do the Minnesota Wild look to extend Fiala in this short off season? I would, yep, I believe so. I think I might have got to this one on an earlier show, but just in case I didn't, I think that should become more and more of a priority. Uh, I think it should. We're not hearing too many rumors about it, but it sounds like the conversation has started according to Bill Guerin and these, these press conferences when they ask him questions and this and that, and he throws out little feelers here and there. Generally, he's like an open book, but obviously with contracts, he's not going to be as open about that necessarily, but I do believe the conversation has started. It certainly started with uh, Carson Soucy because he's a UFA, so that's probably a little bit higher priority in that sense, but Carson Soucy, Kevin Fiala, obviously you can't compare the two's value for the team. As good as Soucy is, Fiala, <laughs> yeah. Fiala's at least the second best player if uh, uh, long term with Coppers out on the roster, at least the second best player. Derek continues. If you have any, yep, there you go. Thank you again very much for bringing those guys on board. Jay Bushy says the experts have said this is a deep draft class. Is there any? Is there a center besides Byfield that the Wild could target at nine? Marco Rossi, Marco Rossi, Jay. Yep, uh, that's who I like. Obviously, because if he's there, and all kinds of different mock drafts have Marco Rossi going as high as like five to Ottawa. Uh, otherwise, 8 to Buffalo and hopefully 9 to Minnesota. 
Minnesota cannot pass on on Byfield. They just can't do that. They have certain draft uh, mock drafts for the Wild pass on both Lindale and Rossi and take Jake Sanderson. Uh, no, <laughs> that's been out there as well. I believe the conversation was in the MNW prospects. We were having a kind of a group conversation that's been there for a while. It's pretty cool stuff. Uh, Justin Backey, Brandon Quast, and Pavel Bennett. Kind of, it's like a group conversation that we've kept up for a long time. Just when stuff breaks, or just just conversation about this and that. Uh, that's where things stand there, Jay. Uh, but Marco Rossi, if he's there, I, I take him in a heartbeat. I mean, he's got skills. That that guy's got skills. His skating is good. His uh, release, he can. He, he's a goal scoring center who can do a little bit of everything. So that's my guy. I, Marco Rossi, I endorse for the Minnesota Wild at number nine. Pray to God he's there. Jay Bushy, what are your thoughts on the current state of the Minnesota Wild roster? Well, that's a that's a big one, right? <laughs> the current Wild roster, huh? Well, incomplete. It starts with a big I, right? Because Marcus Johansson is listed as your number one center at the moment. Victor Rask could possibly be your fourth line center. And conversation now is that uh, Bill Guerin is not interested in buying out Victor Rask. Uh, I can kind of understand that because, eh, you know, it's not the worst buyout ever. See, because now I got the buyout calculator up. Puckpedia, thank you very much, Puckpedia. This is some cool stuff. Um, so the actual cap hit would be four years, 1.33, you know, you get the idea. You know, 1 million and then 300 $33,333 for four years. So this one's actually split up evenly. Sometimes it's it's front-loaded, you know, when it comes to the cap hit, and then it gets smaller, but, you know, it gets smaller for the last couple of years post-contract. Like, it's a little front-loaded on the in the first year. So it's still high the first year, and then the next year it drops, and then the last three years it's, like, equivalent to half or one-third of, well, it'd probably be one-third of uh, what the normal cap hit would have been at the end of the day. But in this case, it's... 1.333, you get the idea. They save 2.6, basically, so to speak, with all sixes and then a seven at the end, if you get the idea. The first two years, which would have been the remaining years on the contract, and then the next two years, we're on the hook for the 1.3 repeating line type of deal. So they don't like buyouts because this would pile up. Uh, Dubnik wouldn't be as bad. It, it Buyouts suck and everything. It's just one year remaining. It's just that, again, what do you do with this roster spot? That's where things are going to get kind of frustrating and annoying at the end of the day. So, and he, you know, he showed something. He was okay, I thought, Victor Rask, when he played fourth line this past year. He wasn't that bad. So it wouldn't kill me if Victor Rask is still on the roster. It, it wouldn't. Somebody out there might be like, are you kidding? You want Victor Rask back? That's like the, <laughs> that's the Judd Zolgads of the world. They think I'm like a complete idiot, but... Yeah, but it's, you know, it's four years of cap hit, though, compared to two. It's It, it doubles. Just imagine buying out, like, uh, Jonas Brodin. You'd have 14 years of cap hit. <laughs> Wouldn't that be funny? Yeah, we're not going to buy out Jonas Brodin, by the way. I'm just uh, joking, obviously. <sighs> Some of these line pairings have Marcus Foligno on the top line. And he might be the next captain of the team, maybe. That's just a big maybe. He's not a top line player. <laughs> no. Obviously, uh, Greenway, no. He he's not going to be a captain of this team. He doesn't have the... He just doesn't. Uh, Cunning's closer. Some people think that he could be a possibility, but I think it's too early. That'd be like giving Charlie Coyle the captaincy, like in his third year or something. It'd be like, no. It's going to be tough. Maybe we go back to the frickin' rotation, which I'd hate. Otherwise, uh, this is completely messed up. It's just because, yeah, because Su uh, Suter was out. That's why. This is totally messed up. Why would Carson Susie be on the top pairing? No. Uh, Brodeen's not a captain material. He's a little too quiet, even though I think he's solid. He's smart. He's a genius out there. Literally a genius. Uh, Spurgeon is probably the top candidate today to be the can uh, the captain of the Wild because, again, Marcus Foligno is in uncertainty with his contract situation. You don't know if he's going to be here, and he might get picked up by the Seattle Sea Chicken Kraken. So we'll see what happens. <sighs> We're going to get cracking with those uh, pistachios. It, yeah. Is that okay that I said that? They're getting cracking with the pistachios. That should be their number one sponsor. Okay, maybe that wasn't too funny, but I, I thought it was. All right. Uh, the state of the roster, though, generally speaking, it's incomplete. Parisi's might, Parisi might get traded. Dumba might get traded. Brodeen and Spurgeon are here for a while. Sp uh, Suter's going to stay, if you like it or not. It's incomplete. It would not be a playoff team to me right now. Uh, and maybe that's okay. Maybe we have to suck for a year or two. 
Uh, obviously, you got supreme talent at the top with Kirill Kaprizov. That's something they failed to mention on the line because actually they didn't officially have it. That was basically the end of the the postseason. That's probably why we're, you're seeing that with uh, what is it called, the daily faceoff. Uh, Kirill Kaprizov on the left, Fiala right, and the center would be Marcus Johansson. You have speed, so your top line actually is pretty good. But beyond that, ooh, ee, ah, I don't know. Cunning on the right, Parisi on the left, and uh, Jules Eriksson in the middle. That's not bad. It's not. He's not really a good second liner necessarily. Bukestad would probably be third line. Sturm fourth. So I, it could be worse because Gal- Galchenyuk's not coming back. They already gave up number 27 to Bukestad. That's just a indication, like Adios, Amigo. Zuccarello would be on the third. Greenway on the on the uh, Zuccarello and Greenway would be with uh, Bukestad if he's healthy, and then Sturm would be the uh, center. I'm trying to think who'd be on the left. Maybe Rask. Either Sturm or Rask would be on the left. Actually, Rask is a right shot. Who? That's kind of weird. Hartman would be on the right. That's a guarantee. Other than that, eh, you know, it's hard to say exactly. Who would be where when it comes to the uh, the left shot or the uh, the final line there? Let's see. Uh, well, probably Donato. Pardon me. Yeah, Donato for sure. Excuse me. Of course, Donato would at least be on the fourth line, but I can't imagine he's happy being there. It's not a good fit. He should probably be on a higher position, get some opportunities, maybe at least try to be on a second power play unit sometimes. Ah, complicated situation. It's a complicated, incomplete lineup, obviously. I think Louis Belpedio needs to be on the right shot, third pairing. And Brad Hunt needs to be the seventh defenseman. I'm just, I'm done with that right now, when you talk about the roster. I'm done with Brad Hunt getting full-time right defense. He's a left shot anyway. So, you know, it's it's kind of a weird situation. So you'd have Suter, hopefully, you know, obviously you'd have Brodine and Suter on the left with Susie, hopefully manning the uh, the final left position. And then we could have Brad Hunt be the uh, the extra guy. And then, of course, uh, Spurgeon, uh, Dumba, and our good friend Louis Belpedio. I think Louis Belpedio needs to be on the NHL roster. I should write about that. No. Oh, don't steal my idea now, right? And Greg Patter needs to just go. Like, seriously, I, I don't know. That's the other annoying part. He's still there. Ugh. Still stuck with him for another year. Yeah, so, sorry again. I'm getting long-winded, but... It's, there's a lot to say when you talk about the roster. It's a broad question, but it's a good question, Jay. So that's why I enjoy that. It's a good question. Um, so we'll continue. Sorry for snapping my lips every 10 seconds. Ty Sandstrom says, if the Wild land the first pick in the draft. Okay, this is a little early, isn't it? Look for a trade partner. No, I would have taken Lafreniere or Byfield at the end of the day. So that was from the previous show. Yeah, those were from the previous show that I talked about. I, I do remember getting into those. <sighs> yep, Derek is not a big fan of uh, Miga Cuevo. And again, do look up his old article, uh, Crease and his, uh, No, this he was on uh, Gone Puck Wild, of all places, actually, five years ago or so, when he uh, had a lot to say about Miga Cuevo. Awesome read, actually. And I agree. I, uh, Derek, I agree with you more than you think when it comes to Cuevo. I was just being kind of nice about Cuevo a little bit but I agree with you a lot more than you think. Let's just say Francisco Liriano. Like, you're getting tired of him to, tired of waiting for him to step up. That type of thing. That's how it got with Cuevo for a while with me. Yeah, he was a captain. He works his ass off. He's this and that, but there was always something missing. That's what I didn't like. And again, I'm not going to kick on the guy's grave, so to speak, even, you know, when it's like the end of his career, that type of thing. I don't mean to do that. It's just at the same time, you know, you have to be honest as well. Justin Backey, again, of MNW Prospects and of Sound the Foghorn Podcast says, what are your thoughts on Hovanov and his lack of being in the lineup for AK Bars? Yeah, that's in the K- uh, the KHL. How do you feel about what seems to be the end of an era with so many vets gone or seemingly available to be moved? I'll answer the second part first. I'm happy. It's time. It's time. It's time. Hint, hint, I'm happy. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. <laughs> You'll find out why in a later, at a later date, and uh, about certain things. You'll you'll find out what the hint, hint, nudge, nudge is about. But uh, <laughs> but no, it, it's the right thing. Um, it's the right thing to do. It, it it's time, uh, especially the coil knee rider, Granlin, that type of thing. That's why you heard uh, Declan Goff on <laughs> Judd's hockey show, always making fun of Anthony Lepantha's voice, like coil knee rider, Granlin. 
You know, it's kind of like that. It's just, yeah, like they're so excited about the same old players over and over and over again. So I'm totally happy about it. Uh, I love Eric Stahl. absolutely love him. And from what I learned about him a little bit in the offseason, just in some of the conversations he had on those Zoom casts and stuff, I like him more. But too slow. Too slow for the current state of the team. And a lot of his points came just literally because Fiala was spectacular in the postseason. Not trying to diss on him. He's just too slow at this point. And if Marcus Johansson's faster and he could fit with Kaprizov and Mr. Kevin Fiala, well, what the hell? What the hell? As for Hovey, I hope I didn't call him Kovanov. It is Hovenhoff. Uh, I am not sure what's going on there. That's kind of irritating, actually. Uh, at least he's not going to get hurt, or hopefully he's not secretly hurt somehow. But yeah, only one game so far. So I don't know what's up with that. I don't know. I don't like it. It's it's sad a little bit, but again, at least he's not getting hurt. That's the good part, unless he is. Um, I'm kind of confused by it a little bit. Maybe they're just kind of waiting on him. Maybe he's not as ready as he thinks he is to play professional hockey. I would have loved to see him in the AHL. I really would have. I mean, would it kill you to go to Iowa, Hovey? Would it? Come on, you know. Would it? Would it? Would it? I don't think it would have. It's not like he's going to rot there. It's not, unless he's just not that good. Then, well, what, what are you going to do? Derek Felska. Yep, thank you, Justin. That was awesome. Derek Felska says, if Johansson is unable to play center, yep, because there's that, and it's been disappointing at times. Uh, left shot, left winger is what he would be, of course, if he doesn't play center. Sorry. Does that make him a giant miss by Bill Guerin? I only ask because he couldn't stick it at the, uh, yep, the uh, second line center playing for the Sabres and seems to be more comfortable on the wing? Or was it just necessary to change culture and add speed? I do think that. I do think it was necessary to change culture and add speed. I think that's the number one reason for the move. I think that is absolutely the number one reason for the move. Um, unless you could have gotten something significantly better for Eric Stahl, which there's talk the Wild could have gotten uh, the fourth line player, and I'm forgetting his name, Curley from Boston, and a first round pick. But that's on Paul Fenton. That's not Bill Guerin's fault. That was Paul Fenton in that case. Um, that was Paul Fenton's mistake, obviously, and I'm not correcting Derek, Derek Felska for that. He knows that, of course. Uh, he's just wondering more about this uh, Johansson move. I think it was necessary to change culture and add speed. I think so. I think that's the number one reason for the move, honest to God, because, you know, you know, uh, Stahl was an expiring contract, and the quote that Bill Guerin made at the end of, uh, or during the press conference, it wasn't at the end, it was right in the middle, where basically like, hey, you know, the young guys need to step up as, and take more of a leadership role. They heavily relied on Eric Stahl, and now he's gone, so who's going to do it? See? So I, I love that line. Paraphrasing, of course, I'm sure he didn't say it exactly the same, but that's basically what Bill Guerin said. Who's going to do it now? Because he's not there. He, he did that on purpose. A culture change. And it's somebody else's turn to be a leader now because, well, it wasn't working before, unfortunately. So uh, that was most likely what the move was for, in my humble opinion. Derek again says, if Garen believed there was a country, yep, there it is, country club like atmosphere with the team, <laughs> yep, then why give Brodine a no move contract for four years? Because that because isn't that what helped instill an attitude the players can do as they please if they have all their leverage? That's a good point, Derek. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people do. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> yep, that's a box right there. It's just one of those negotiating things. If the no-move clause didn't exist, that would be a lot nicer, wouldn't it? it you know, because I don't think a whole lot of teams would sign a guy for seven years and then trade him right away anyway. But yeah, to add that, it gives the player everything, every bit of leverage. So if Jonas Burdeen doesn't want to get traded to a uh, contender like the Boston Bruins, Tampa Bay Lightning, he would put them on the no-move clause. Supposedly, that's what uh, Mr. Eric Stahl did. He didn't want to get traded to Boston or Tampa because he wanted to stay here in the quote-unquote country club. And then he gets traded to Buffalo, who's not a contender. So he, he didn't put them on the list because he figured, oh, Buffalo's not going to trade for me. Why would they do that? And they did. <laughs> so, okay. Um, yeah, it's four years. That's a while. Uh, I'm guessing it's just the loss of Brodeen would be too much anyway, unless... Man, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think you make a damn good point there, Derek. I, I really do. It, it reeks of it a little bit. But Brodeen, to me, he just he's so valuable. He, he's more valuable than some of those other guys, i got to think. He's, he's not a coil. He's not a Nita Ryder, a Grandland. I think he's beyond them a bit. 
he's, he's an essential piece, we'll say. Whoops, now I just activated the whole thing here. And I hope it didn't throw it off. No, it didn't. Thank you, God. It didn't It didn't throw it off. Okay, but uh, really good point, Derek. That's a, that's a nice question mark to uh, ask Bill Guerin in a lot of ways, too. Uh, thank you again for that. That was good. Jay Bushy says, Do you think there will be any trades by GM Bill Guerin this offseason? Yes. Yep. Absolutely, because, again, like I said about the roster, incomplete. Yes, uh, something's up because you can't go into the regular season with just Marcus Johansson, Jul Eriksson, Nick Bukestad, and Victor Rask or uh, Nico Sturm as your centers. You can, but talk is that uh, Mr. Bukestad can play on the right wing, obviously, and he has many times around. <clears throat> and I don't think Bukestad is necessarily somebody you can count on for the season because he's had a lot of injury problems. So... I don't know. I, there's going to be something. A lot of people do believe that Dumba is going to get traded before the the regular season. Sorry for getting so far away from the mic. Might have caused a little echo there. A little bit of a cavernous uh, audio. I apologize, guys. Um, guys and gals. Yes, there's there's going to be a trade. There's going to be a significant one, and it could be related to what Dave Johnson's saying up right above you here. Dave Johnson says, Domi and Monaghan as trade targets. Your thought? Absolutely, Monaghan. Um, and... That one's the one that makes the most sense because, well, when you put two and two together, Matt Dumba's from Calgary, Alberta. <laughs> yeah, Matt, Matt Dumba is from Calgary, Alberta. And Calgary is interested in Matt Dumba from conversations. I believe uh, M- Michael Russo just mentioned that on his uh, his uh, Russo show on Talk North. That's the Talk North one, which used to be Russo Suhan, that type of thing. That, that one. <laughs> the Talk North hockey show, I believe they call it. Uh, Shane Monahan, oh, I like him. I like him a lot. He's an 80-point type of guy, 70-point type of guy. I'm a fan of, of Mr. Monahan. <laughs> I am a fan of Mr. Monahan. I uh, At the end of the day. And, you know, I'm a, I kind of like the Flames, too. So, I mean, I'm a huge fan. I think I called him Sean. I think I called him Shane, didn't I? It is Sean. And it's, I don't know what I'm talking about, so my apologies for that. I'm just, like, <laughs> being random here. It is, uh, obviously. Uh, he's only 25 years of age and tons of talent. $6.5 million, so the salaries are close. That's what I like about... Uh, I like a lot of things about Sean Manahan, obviously. Again, only 25 years of age. There's your top line center. Again, he's not a superstar, but he's really good. Um, obviously, he didn't have a great season necessarily this past year, but he's had 30 goals three times, and again, he's only 25. He's not plagued with injury history. Listen to this sound. Knock on wood. Can you hear that? I think I made it lo- almost too loud. He does not have injury history. Hallelujah. And I mean, he does a lot of things that the Wild need. He scores goals. Duh. And he sets other players up. He's a perfect fit for the Minnesota Wild, and I think uh, Calgary could use a little help on the uh, right shot defense. I mean, you have Giordano, but he's he's old. He's like mid-30s. He's obviously a Norris Trophy type of guy, but he's ancient history uh, at some point. Eventually, he's going he's gonna, to you know, he's gonna slow down, and it's going to be time for him to move on. You'll have Matt Dumba for a long time there. It's a trade that makes sense, as long as Calgary's okay with it, that type of thing. Calgary's okay with the thought of losing Sean Monaghan. I'm a huge fan. Again, sorry for calling him Shane. I'm just like having a, <laughs> a funny moment here, but it's just one of those things that goes with the show at times. Uh, I would love to have Sean Monaghan. Do- Domi would be a nice addition, but Monaghan, I think, it makes the most sense of all of them at the end of the day for multiple reasons. I believe that's it. I believe that's it for the questions, and thank you guys for doing that. I miss hearing from some of you out there. I would like to hear from Dan Minnesota again one of these days. Hopefully, <laughs> looking forward to his book coming out. Big shout out for that in case he's listening. Uh, Tom Hayen, love hearing from you as well. I think he didn't, yeah, and Tim McHugh, guys like that. So maybe they just didn't get around at this time, and that's unfortunate. But hope to hear from you guys soon again. It's probably as games come back, they'll probably uh, ask more questions than that. Hopefully I didn't scare them away for some reason, that type of thing. <laughs> but uh, really appreciate you guys with the uh, the questions and the conversation, it always makes the show better. Can't thank you guys enough. MNW Prospects, of course, big shout out for them. Pavel Burnett, Justin Backey, and uh, Brandon Quast. Also, Chad Walski posts in there. We keep up with the Minnesota Wild Prospects. We keep up with the Minnesota Wild as well. That's in that, but uh, generally the prospects is the main thing. But of course, we keep up with games and prospects that are on the roster. You know, guys like Greenway, guys like that. You consider a prospect. Nico Sturm, 
Well, Sturm is actually a little older already, which is sad but true. Uh, Susie's obviously not a prospect anymore. But, yeah, Belpedia would be that type of thing. We came up with all those guys. And it's all because what's exciting about keeping up with the prospects is it gives you hope. You're hoping and praying one of them is going to be the next Sean Monahan, <laughs> And you'll be our top center. You're hoping that there's going to be somebody like a better version of a Miko Koivu. Maybe. We'll see. Uh, Nico, Nico Sturm is... Uh, an intriguing player who's clearly got skill. So we'll see what happens. He's got that youth, he's got the strength, and he's got skill. So we'll see what Nico Sturm could do long term as at least a, a bottom six type of guy. We'll see what happens with him. Uh, again, thank you so much for the conversation. Always, always, always appreciate it. Derek Felska, Crease and Assist. Facebook.com forward slash <laughs> Brave the Wild dot Minnesota, which is kind of goofy, but it is what it is at Brave the Wild and at Paladino Live again. And again, the MNW Prospects. Look that up on Facebook as well. MNW Prospects. With that said, I think that's a wrap. We wrapped up the season. This and that, again, did not wrap up the Stanley Cup Final. That'll go on the next show. Free agency and draft. Free agency conversation, draft conversation. It'll be post-draft, of course. And post-Stanley Cup Final, of course. And some free agency talk, because i got a feeling something's going to happen between now and then. Something very significant. Maybe it's happening right now, and I don't and I don't realize it. So, with that said, thank you again for everything. Thank you for your listenership. Thank you for your loyalty to the show. Those of you that share it, I can't thank you enough. Other than uh, keep, keep sharing it if you can. And if, if you don't, that's unfortunate, but that's your choice. <laughs> but uh, please keep sharing it. Thank you so much. And tell your friends about it. Other than that, we will talk to you in a couple of weeks. Hopefully something really exciting has happened between now and then, and hopefully the Wild are able to get the right guy in the draft and some other right guys down the, down the line there in the second, third, fourth rounds. We'll see what happens. It's going to be very exciting. We will now close with uh, one final thing. Just want to encourage you to please write a positive rating for Brave the Wild on iTunes or whichever application if they offer that. But I know iTunes slash Apple Podcast does. I don't think Google does and they should. I don't know why. But please give a positive rating if you could. It would only help the show greatly if you want to help out. Five star, four star, whatever it is. Hopefully not anything below that. Uh, give a nice comment if you can. If you don't, it is what it is. But as long as it's a good rating, it's greatly appreciated. And I can't thank you enough in advance for any of you that might be able to do that. Other than that, again, if you'd like to join the show via audio, simply uh, use the freeze voice recording application that's built into every smart device on the planet, pretty much. Just open it up, click record, talk, treat it like a phone call, keep it to about five minutes, hit stop, save it, and email it to paladinolive at yahoo.com, paladinolive at yahoo.com. I will then convert it into an MP3 file, thanks to zumzar.com, which is uh, an awesome website for converting files and all that. Gotta give them (laughs) a free plug because they're giving me a free service that helps the show at the end of the day. With that said, again, I hope all of you have a nice couple weeks here leading up. Hopefully something awesome happens like I've been saying, and go Minnesota Wild!